Hello and welcome to World Cycling Productions video of the 83rd Tour de France. I'm Phil Liggett and it's great to be back with you as always. The Tour de France this year covered five countries. It covered a distance of 2,400 miles. It brought together 198 of the finest bike riders in the world. The route itself going first to the Alps, then going across to the west and down into the Pyrenees before a long time trial and the final journey home to Paris. And the rain is coming down again, just as it was when the race last started in Holland in nearby Leiden in 1978, but hopefully it won't be as heavy. Hertogenbosch, known to everybody as the Den Bosch, and the prologue distance is slightly over the regulations allowed by the UCI, but they've given dispensation for it today. And we're in the magic number 51, Evgeny Berzin here, out on the course. It's a shame the rain has come. It's not quite as heavy as it was when, in fact, the prologue time trial after it was run was cancelled and didn't count towards the overall classifications last uh, in, back in 1978. This Waiting to start, Miguel Ingerain in his yellow jersey. is five times the previous winner, Alex Zulit, second last year, waiting to start in the Brabant Holler. While out on the course is big Lance Armstrong, and his times are good. Evgeny Berzin now, he should set the new standard for them all to beat as he comes up towards the line. Chris Borman did a terrific, tremendous ride of 10.55, and he's gone better than Berzin. 10.56.43, Evgeny Berzin has gone one behind Borman. So the British rider who holds the prologue record at 34.3 kilometres an hour is still in the hot seat. Out on course, a rider who also crashed like Bourbon last year in saint brieuc Alex Zula. And Zula will take the risk as we now go back to the finish for the arrival of Tony Rominger. There's Borman's time. Rominger is well outside of it. He's taken no chances at all. Rominger only fourth at the moment and there's some big names still to finish. And none bigger than the last man out on the circuit, Miguel Ingerain. And I wonder whether he'll take any chances because approaching the finish now is the rider who's just started in front of him, Alex Zula. Zula has taken plenty of risks around these corners. He's been skimming off the tight the line through the barriers and Zula's time is going to beat Chris Borman. Borman is going to be knocked off the leader's pile with just two riders left to come in. Alex Zula, 10.53.84 is the leader and here is the face of Big Big himself, up the gears. Now Miguel's time has not been as good as Zula through the checkpoints out on the course and so it's proving now as he approaches the finish. Miguel Indurain is not going to start tomorrow in yellow. He wears the yellow jersey today as last year's winner, 11 and only 7th place for Miguel Ingerain. That really is a little bit below par for him. There's the result, Boardman losing 2 seconds, Berzin 3rd. What a prologue, look at the names here. Alano 4th and Tony Rominger 5th. Well, it was a close finish. To be frank, I'm surprised it was that close. I thought I'd be 3rd, uh, maybe 4th. I was going okay down the straights, but as I said, there's no way I could take the risks on the, on the corners. Very frustrating, but you just have to make the decisions. And the opening stage will stay here, based in Den Bosch in Holland. But let's now have a look as we remind ourselves of the overall distance of the race and the fact that there are 198 starters. Let's have a look and see how we rank the contenders for the 1996 Tour de France. It's top marks in three of the five categories for Miguel Indurain. Occasionally, though, he has been left wanting in the mountains. And if his team is suspect, as we think it is, it could make him fallible in 1996. Laurent Jalabert's one advantage over Indurain is his immensely strong team. The man who gives the French hope is now the world number one ranked rider. He's a winner and he has a great confidence in himself. Tony Rominger equals Indurain in our points table because he has a strong team to back him. The Swiss superstar has also beaten Indurain in both mountains and time trial in recent years. At 35, it could be the last chance for him to claim the Spaniard's scalp. Evgeny Berzin is weak on experience, having retired in this race last year. But he can ride well in the time trials and he can climb. If his team can back him, he could become the first Russian to win the race. Alex Zula is part of Laurent Jalabert's strong Onse team. The Swiss rider, second place overall in Paris last year, has left him believing in himself and a great backup to the Frenchman. We give Chris Borben a low assessment because we feel winning is still beyond him. He's never finished the race. But the 27-year-old still promises so much. 
to survive the mountains could mean a high placing in Paris for him and make him a favour for the future. This year, yes, it is. It is the great unknown. And I'm trying to think of it as a challenge and not a problem. It's, it's, it's a long race, twice as long as anything I've ever done before. Uh, so a lot of people keep biting off a little bit more than I can chew out of their enthusiasm for somebody to, to get behind and support. And that's nice, it's what you call a nice problem to have, but uh, I feel that pressure. But for me, I mean, to take the allergy as yesterday would have been great, that would have been a little bit of insurance, but that's gone, and that's life. Because yesterday I had to make the decision, am I here for three weeks or am I here for ten minutes? And uh, I was definitely, I had to make the decision three weeks. So, if I have one really good day in the mountains where I'm riding with the front group, and I come into Paris in the first 20, that for me would be progression. And I wouldn't say I'd be ecstatic with that, but I could be content with that, and it would be something to move on from from the future. And this opening stage is staying a base on the city of Den Bosch in the southeast of Holland. And the rider's very worried about the stage because they're always nervous. He's opening first days in the tour. When riders get uh, used to riding with one another, everybody believes they can win the stage and not surprisingly in Holland, the roads are flat and the riders believe that they have a real chance of striking out and getting a stage win. But the problem is the crashes and there we have it. Now there was a rider down on the right and it's the Spanish rider who finished 10th last year, Hernan Buena Hora of the Kelme boy. He's in a precarious position there as he gets his bike off the road, but he does look as though he's quite badly injured with that right knee. And somebody else is down as well. Perhaps we can see it better here. The wind keeping the riders uh, pinned to the left-hand side of the road. And Buena Hora is shot out of the line over to the right. And there's another rider and a little bit of leapfrogging with the bikes over the broken machinery here. Oh, Paneri does a pretty good job at mountain riding. But that is a great shame, and that is about the second or third crash we've had already today. And Buena Hera uh, has been announced as having retired from the race with his injuries, and this is Tilly Marie. Now this was a sort of central reservation here in the middle of the median strip. Marie has gone slamming into that sign. Tilly Marie, who has been a great prologue glider over the years in the Tour de France, he's won it three times, he's also had one of the longest breakaways ever too to win the stage and get the yellow jersey back and he's in trouble. There's a little crash up the road and I think there's somebody over to the right here and that to me uh, looks like uh, Luc Leblanc who has gone down on the right of the road here and the doctor Gérard Porte is with Luc Leblanc. Let's have a look down. There's Tiddy Marie going into the centre and at the same time, there's a rider gone off to the left because another rider fell and it seems to be a completely separate incident. Well, this is Luc Leblanc and it looks like he's going on. Well, hats off to him because he looked as though he was down and out for the count there, Luc Leblanc. This is the race now as we head up towards the finish and the riders are still clear of the field. There's a, the bunch is actually split in these crosswinds. And little Andre Schmil is trying to get in on the action. Leon Van Bon is leading it out for the Robo Bank. There is Mario Cipollini, the champion of Italy, shirt, green top. Also trying to get through is the white jersey of Frederic Moncassan. This is going to be a very tight finish indeed. Jerome Blyleven is pushing hard as well. That's Blyleven for TVM. And I think it is also Zabel who's trying to move over to the right, but he's dropped away from it. Frederic Moncassan and Blyleven's right on the line, and it's gone to Moncassan. What a start for the Gann team. They get the first stage win of this year's Tour de France. And that was a day for the sprint. In fact, it wasn't Zabel, it was Verada who was up there in third. Blylavens gets second. Overall, Alex Zula keeps his lead after the prologue win by three seconds over Berzin and seven over Abraham Alano. And back in 1994, Frederick Moncassam, well, he fell off the presentation podium at the start of the tour, broke his ankle and was unable to start. This morning, Mario Kuma, a non-starter, after a broken collarbone yesterday. Now, at 17 kilometres to go, the riders cross from Belgium into France. Now, in Belgium, it is compulsory to wear a crash helmet when you are racing. But take one step into France, and it then becomes the rider's personal choice. But my advice, after the way Mario Cipollini was sprinting yesterday, is to keep these helmets on. And as the riders head in towards Vascal, we've completely traversed Belgium today without stopping, coming through from Holland, and we're just going across to the border town of Vascal. And TVM have now got control of the head of the peloton. They couldn't win with Blyleven, a Dutchman in Holland. Perhaps they'll have better luck as they arrive in France. 
Frederick Moncassan heading up towards the yellow jersey with a six seconds bonus at the start of the first hotspot sprint today. Now, can he snatch any more at the finishing line as the riders break for the finish? It looks as though a late rush by Vyacheslav Yekimov is going to come to north as the sprinters all come up behind in the Saika boys trying to organize themselves for Cipollini. But look at this now, Moncassan has got himself in on the action. Mario Cipollini is trying to break away but he's dropped back a little bit as Moncasan goes again on the left of our picture and a strong attack too coming from Zabel, Eric Zabel, Mario Cipollini in the centre now, Blyleven's on the right, Cipollini's going to make it, Cipollini, Blyleven's over the line and the third place I think was Jan Zarada in that green points jersey and as we look down here what an easy win for Mario Cipollini. So, the self-proclaimed fastest man in the world is back in a big way and we are only on to stage two of the Tour de France and the celebratory champagne is already being poured. This is the overall standings after two stages of racing now. Azula a second ahead of Moncassan. The battle for the bonuses will follow. Berzine is third as we move on now to stage number three and taking us down through France into nogent sur Alex Zula still in the leader's yellow jersey but beginning to look a little bit fragile now as the challenge is coming from Frederic Moncassan on these flat stages chasing out the sprint bonuses and Baldato is in the action there as well he gets the first one at Duai after 43 kilometers Blylevens and Zverada were the riders who snipped up the four seconds and two seconds bonus now normally today is the team time trial but this year it's out of the tour and here's Gary Imlach to tell us more the look of the team time trial is that of a bunch of futuristic commuters sharing the workload on the way to the office. And at first glance, it's about as dramatic, but it does contribute its share of tour incident. Oh, there's always been a crash here, and this is the this is a disaster for Ariostia. They were recording the best time without a shadow of a doubt. They've collided on that left-hand bend, and they've all gone down here. But I think Argentin and Rolf Sorensen have been lucky, and they've missed it. The rest of the team don't know what to do. Although he crashed in 1991, Rolf Sorensen's team had been pulling him along at such a good lick, he still managed to limp onto the podium to take yellow. In 94, it was the other way round. Chris Boardman's blazing individual speed secured the race lead. His team's collective lack of it let it slip. And that's been the criticism of the team time trial, but it has too much say in the individual standings. It certainly didn't do Tony Rominger any favours in 1993. He went into it 18 seconds behind Miguel Indurain came out of it down by nearly two minutes. Being penalised didn't help, neither did having only four teammates fit enough to finish. The biggest team time trial loser though was Stephen Roach in 1991, who turned up late to find his team had set off without him and ended up being eliminated. Still, he remains a big fan of the team stage, apparently on aesthetic grounds. Well, I think it's a bit unfortunate really for the, the spectacle of the Tour de France in itself because I think the Tour de France is a very uh, beautiful event when you see the the riders all in harmony kind of it's uh, it's very difficult but it's a very spectacular spectacular event i think and it's a pity this year it's not in tour de france so why is it missing this year well it depends who in the tour organization you ask so qu'il faut pas il faut pas rester toujours avec les, les mêmes programmes les mêmes choses euh, fait au même endroit le, le tour de france c'est fait pour, pour changer pour innover pour que les coureurs euh, perdent un petit peu leurs habitudes Et bien sûr, c'est ça qui fait aussi la, la beauté de la course. Je ne prends pas ça pour une innovation, c'est un regret. Car lorsque nous avons préparé le parcours du Tour 96, nous avions prévu un contre-la-montre par équipe au lac de Madine. C'est un très beau parcours. Et puis, vous savez que les règlements de l'UCI nous contraignent de faire le Tour de, jour, le tour de France pardon, dans 23 jours. And it was the team time trial that had to go. A move that's affected just who gets selected for the race. Ja, okay, nou uh, moet je misschien uh, meer uh, renners hebben voor de bergen en niet voor de tijdrit. En uh, gewoon één uh, renners hebben of twee in de ploeg voor de tijdrit uh, individueel en niet voor de ploegentijdrit. Maar het is misschien mooi een keer in zo'n tour zonder ploegentijdrit, maar in de volgende jaren zou het weer beter zijn met een ploegentijdrit. Not that he'd admit it, but the man who stands to gain most from the absence of the team stage is the race's outstanding individual. If there's a team time trial this year, Indurain would have found himself very, very far behind before the, the mountains next week. Because they also have a, an incredible team for a team time trial, contrary to the Vanessa team of Miguel Indurain. 
And the Stephen Roach used to race on the Carrera team. You won't be too happy with the news today that Enrico Zaina, also of Carrera and second in the Giro d'Italia, has retired on the road today towards Nogent. The race are now arriving there. There's been breakaways all day, but they've all been brought back now. And the sprinters once again are going to have their chance. And licking their lips are the Seiko riders after the success yesterday of Mario Cipollini. But the attacks are starting to come that might well spoil the party here. If Frederick Monkerson can snatch a bonus in the first three, then he should take the leader's yellow jersey away from Alex Zula. None of the big stars apart from Jan Zorada have been snatching points at the interim sprints along the road today. Because a breakaway midway through swept up all of the bonus times that really mattered. And now there he is, a three men back from the Saika boys in the green top to his jersey, little Andre Schmiel. Moncassan is also pushing in, he's got the right wheel there behind Mario Cipollini in the white Moncassan. Now the riders are supposed to swing off when you lead out a man, not just free wheel. The Saika boy almost stopped the race there as he didn't move away from the front. But I'm not too sure whether Cipollini's come too late here, his team have run out of steam. As Eric Zabel goes on the left of our picture, and I think they've not given Cipollini a good lead out at all here. Zabel is digging deep, Jan Zarada is coming, he looks as though he's sold at the moment, Plyleavens is out of it. Mokasan might just have got third place there, and if he did, let's have a look at this, he will be in yellow tonight. Eric Zabel gets an early stage win, he got two last year, this time it's an early win for him. Cipollini was gaining on him, but not quick enough. And indeed, Frederic Moncassan did get third place. We're out of fourth. Look at those sprinters all lined up there. But this one was the fastest of the day. Eric Zabel of Germany and the Telecom team. And he's going to be a favourite now for that green points jersey. Overall, though, Frederic Moncassan is the new leader of the tour. The bonus giving him a seven seconds advantage and ten over Evgeny Berzin. There he is. What a dream start for Frederic Moncassan. First of all, the stage win and now the Mayo Jean. As we move on to stage number four, we move away from Soissons, heading to the Lac de Madine. No real hills on the contour, and this man won't care anyway, because these are the nice moments of the Tour de France of Frédéric Moncassin, and I think he might require that yellow jersey back for today's stage. Leaving under clear blue skies, here's the champion of France, having won his title just before the start of the Tour, Stéphane Herlot, also had a great ride, fourth place in the recent Dauphiné Libre. And a former champion of France there, Serge Boucherie, telling Stéphane if he keeps this up, he's going to be the new leader of the Tour. And I don't think Moncassin will mind because Erlo also on the same Gant team. A little bit of hard work being done here by Indurain. No, not Miguel, but brother Prudencio is riding extremely well this year. And this is Herminio Diaz Zabala. Now these are trying to get some inroad into this leading breakaway which contains Danny Nelson, number 86 here, Stefan Erlo, champion of France at the front, Cyril Sogran at the back in yellow, Rolf Jermann of the MG team, he's second from the end in our picture, and Mariano Piccoli, king of the mountains in the Tour of Italy. These are the riders who are in the escape that has got clear and has gained a lot of time. Now you can't let a rider like Erlo go too far because he is a climber as he showed us in the Dauphiné Libre and the field are trying to chase down and reduce that big gap. At the one kilometre banner there's no way now they're going to get up onto the onto the situation here. They're going to come in quite a few minutes down anyway but this is a marvellous piece of riding and Erlo starting the day the best place of the team by a long way just 43 seconds off the Mayo Jean of his teammate Frédéric Moncassin. So Erlo knows already he's going to be the new yellow jersey the first time in his career as it is newcomer Silo Sogra of the Obervilliers team who leads out. I tell you what, if he gets this one, this is going to vindicate the organisation for allowing this young French team into the event. And I'm quite sure there'll be a big smile on the face of Jean-Marie Leblanc. And it looks as though Cyril Sogrand's going to have the greatest moment of his life. Nelson, I'm not surprised and annoyed. The amateur world champion will take only second place. Cyril Sogrand gets the stage win. What a surprising tour this is already turning out to be. He could never have possibly have dreamt of this happening to him. The breakaway has worked and he has been proven to have the best sprint. There's the clock counting down the time gap. The arrival of the Mayo Jean now passing across to his teammate Erlo. The green jersey also of Jan Zorada. Zorada's gone down. He clipped the back wheel. The two riders from Gant looked over. Bjorn Arish is on the barriers there. He was lucky to miss it. You can see the champion of Denmark far left as it's just a touch of wheels there and it looked to be totally the fault of Jan Zorada. That's Paul O'Lolland Broshard who's gone skydiving over the top of Zverada and the grit of the teeth of the Danish champion Reese. he was lucky to stay upright 
Thank heavens for the barriers, which is more than you could say for Abdu Japarov a few years ago when he hit them at the finish of a stage in Paris. And so there's the result, Sirio Sogran getting the victory over Nelson. the main field coming in almost five minutes back. And Yumai Ojorn, yet again, now it's on the shoulders of Stefan Erlo by 22 seconds over Piccoli, the men of that breakaway taking the top five places overall. This is where the rest are standing right now. As we move on to stage number five, heading on now to Besançon, what a dream start for the GAN team have had so much success. And Stéphane Erlo, the first Breton, that's the northern part of France, to wear the maillot jaune since 1992, when it was worn by Pascal Lino. Well, among the non-starters this morning, Mario Cipollini, the champion of Italy, has chosen not to start. He says he's feeling unwell. There are others who are saying he's going away to prepare especially for the Olympic Games in Atlanta. Southwesterly winds and cloudy today and rather chilly 18 degrees Celsius. And the whole field compact as they roll away. No real challenges on the road today, a couple of small hills, and there's a crash down there, and look at the way the peloton has spread round in a big circle, crossing a narrow bridge, and this is another bit of confusion, riders falling, as they have been daily in this race, uh, taking out one or two of the stars as well, and in fact, it looks as though Lance Armstrong is unhappy with Gilles Bouvard and Lotto, I tell you what, uh, disqualification is imminent, that's the first offence for fighting if the referees decide to apply it, and Bouvard of Lotto, apparently blamed by Lance there for the crash. This is Fagnini, who I think has got himself uh, a damaged collarbone there and may well be out of the tour, but the race goes on and the cloudy conditions have given way to sunshine as we approach the finish, heading up towards Besançon. And the Telecom boys now feeling they have a chance to get a few more points in the hat for Eric Zabel. Because among the riders who have abandoned uh, since that crash, Jan Zarada, who really didn't recover from that fall yesterday, has not finished the stage. He is gone wearing the green jersey for Paneria. And so that now means that Zabel has a real chance of pulling on the green jersey. But not before there's an attack. It looked like Leon van Bonn who went. And he's an opportunist who won a stage this year with a similar move near the finish. But that's not Van Bon, that's Ekimov. Ekimov, the, another opportunist who likes to fly in the last couple of kilometres, as he used to do when he was a Soviet Union rider on the track. Broke world record after world record alone against the watch, and he still has a fine turn of speed in those legs, but not to hold off the whole of the Tour de France today. As the riders come together, even Bjorn Aris is getting in on the action here, a non-sprinter as he's trying to find a way through for Eric Zabel. The champion of Denmark for the second year in succession and Frederick Monkasan has taken off his wheel, there he goes. Monkasan in the green jersey, more points for him perhaps. Jerome Vlaile, which is coming on the left. This is going to be very close, he makes it look easy. He won at Dunkirk last year. Vlaile has now got his victory here in Besançon. And there is the confirmation, Monkasan, Zabel, Travassoni, Abdu, Japarov and Ferragato in that order over the line. So, a great result. Let's join Paul Sherwin at the finish. That was a very well judged sprint at the end. It looked as if Monkasan was going to get it to begin with. Yeah, today I took uh, the good wheel. The first day I was out of bad wheels and I had not so luck. But today I had uh, a lot of luck and I won. You need both as a sprinter, but this rider wasn't too worried about the result of the sprint. Stefan Erlo keeping his overall yellow jersey by that same 20 seconds, and that breakaway still surviving in the top five places. Alex Zula, birthday today, he wallows four minutes, five seconds off yellow. Uh, the happy days when he started in yellow um, in his first Tour de France, they've gone now. Heading on from Arc A Senon down to Aix les Bains, 128.6 miles today, and it'll be the 20th time we'll have arrived at Aix les Bains. People like Eddie Merckx and Greg LeMond have won here, and also Dmitry Konishev, who won in 1991. But returning to this year's Tour de France, here's a sad sight, as we now see Lance Armstrong in heavy, heavy rain. He has complained of a sore throat and it looks as though he's decided to call it quits. Well, this is amazing, but the Tour de France, which only started today on the stage six with 181 riders, has now lost Alexander Gonchenkov. He was a non-starter this morning. We're now seeing the goodbye here of Lance Armstrong. And uh, that is very, very sad indeed, not just for Armstrong, but also for Motorola, because they are now something of a headless team without their team captain. 
They have riders individually for stage wins, but they don't have anybody really for a high overall finish, except perhaps Laurent Madwas. And no, we don't need the race conditions, do we? Just look at them. Torrential rain and flood water reported on the roads as the riders get down to the finish at aix les bains They are all more or less huddled together. And hardly for comfort, warnings again of obstacles in the centre of the road. This time it's the Onse team sending the signals. A matter of self-survival here by the professionals of the Tour de France. A race which has been battered by the crashes every day. And now we have an attack here and again it comes from the Rabobank. And it's Michael Bogart. Well, you have to be Dutch, I think, to break away in these conditions and take all the risks because they are such good bike handlers. And Bogart has ridden away from the peloton here simply by breaking that little bit later on these very, very dangerous corners. And I wonder if he's going to hang on because they're coming at him in a big rush here. It's going to be a tight finish as Zabel is trying to catch him, but it's all too late. Zabel will have to be content with second this time as Michael Bogart takes his very first stage win in a Tour de France. And even in these conditions, can he afford to smile? So the result, uh, Bogart getting it for Rabobank, Zabel second, Jalabert coming in the frame for the first time this year. He is in third place, so last year's green jersey may be a challenger yet. Happy birthday to Alex Zula, he's 28, he climbs up to third overall. We're now on day eight. The overall race leader this morning, as the riders head out from Chambry, is the Frenchman Stefan Erlot. But the big names today will try to challenge because we're now in the Alps. The riders come up the climb of the Col de la Madeleine, the first all-category climb of the Tour. That means it's a major mountain. But you know, the weather has been the talking point. Yesterday they finished in torrential rain. Today they say the temperatures will plummet to just 5 degrees Celsius. And there could even be snow on the top of the Col de la Madeleine. Without more ado, let's get to the action. <laughs> and just a reminder, yes, it's supposed to be summer in France in the month of July. Uh, just a shaving under 200 kilometres, 124 miles the race today. This is a reminder of the overall situation, a 20-second gap to Piccoli, having a good Tour de France, as he did Tour de Tour of Italy. Alex Zula, the big challenger in third, and the return of Laurent Jalabert now, he is up to fourth. Further down the list, Abraham Olano, the world champion on the road race, he's in sixth place. And this is the situation as the riders come over the top of the Col de la Madeleine. Well, there is no snow, but there is very, very poor visibility. And all the way up, of the, up the climb, the yellow jersey has been in trouble. He's gone over the top a minute and 11 seconds down, Stefan Erlo. As the riders here, this is a, another group over four and a half minutes down. This first day in the mountains has done an awful lot of damage. Now, look at these conditions here. There is moisture on our camera lens as well. We can't do anything about that. Valentino Foy, what a lucky man he is. He's gone off the road on the descent and he's chosen a stretch of the mountain where he doesn't go downhill too quickly. He looks okay as he comes back up to the roadside. As we go back up to the leaders here and it's the big MIG himself now. He hates weather like this. You can see him well wrapped up. He's got warm gloves on there. And Miguel Indurain will be feeling reasonably happy with the way things are going. He's got control of the front of the pace. If you don't like the day, you don't like the climbs, then try and get to the front and ride them at your pace and keep everybody behind you. That's his attitude on his shoulder, is Alex Zula. Number 181 here, the Kelme rider, is Fernando Escartin. And number 14 is Eitor Gomendia. A very select little group, Abraham Olano, the world champion, far right of our picture. And the new champion of Spain, Fernandez Gines, is sitting at the back of this very, very select group. Gone is the Mayo Jean and still lingering behind the race, and he's certainly out of the hunt now. We really did expect Stefan Erlo today to be up uh, with a group of this size because he certainly is an above average climber, and I think he has a problem with his right knee, which he has been complaining about. A sad sight for Great Britain because Chris Boardman has also uh, been dropped off the back on the climb of the Col de la Madeleine. He too is quite a way down and learning perhaps the realities of the Tour de France because Chris is yet to finish the Tour. He may hold the record for the fastest prologue ever but he also holds the other record for the fastest exit ever which he did last year in the prologue when he crashed after about a mile. The brave souls have come up onto the climb of the Cormet de Roseland, which has come after 163 kilometres. An attack there by Bjorn Ries, champion of Denmark, but not so at the back of the race, because I think there is the odd tear in the eyes there of Stefan Erlo. 
Three days in the Maillot Jaune in his first Tour de France and the way he's riding there, I think it's all over for him. Well, they brought back Bjorn Arise. Rees had a meeting in November with his team and promised them he could win the Tour. The majority of the meeting have laughed so far, but you know, he does look to have good form. If they believe in Rees and give him the support, who knows? Long Dufault. And Dufault, in fact, a minute 15 behind, the leader on the road bolts, but look at this man, he was the leader of the Tour de France. He has signalled to his team car, it's all over. Well, I think, uh, by my reckoning, he is only the 12th man to lead the Tour de France wearing the Maillot Jaune and Stéphane Hello, He does have a problem, I think his tendonitis in his right knee. He is out of the Tour and that is very, very sad. We're back up at the front now and Dufault has in fact joined, uh, not joined, but passed Udo Boltz, the attacking rider, who went clear on the climb of the Cormet de Roselen. He has now been caught and dropped as we've gone over the top of the Borg uh, of the Prima Borg Saint Maurice. And now Laurent Dufault is going to make a bid. As we join the rather narrow roads here on the descents that are bound, but at least the sun has come out. There's some very, very difficult descents on the Cormet de Roselen. Oh my goodness me! And that uh, is a rider from Rabobank who has gone clean off into this ravine here on the descent of the Cormet de Roseland. And in fact, it is Johan Brunil who has gone down, but he looks perfectly okay. What a shock. And in fact, can you believe this? This man is just looking for another bike. I doubt whether they'll get the other one back. And there it is, uh, Johan Brunil who's having a great ride. He was with the main chase group on the mountain. Straight back into the fray and hardly a look backwards. Absolutely amazing. This is Laurent Dufault, the leader on the road now of the Tour de France. The sun is out. Perhaps this will help Miguel Indurain. He's a little bit like a lizard. He needs plenty of sun to warm up for the action. Tony Rominger right behind him. The far side of him there was Alex Zula. And now the message coming to Laurent Dufault. He has a real chance here on the climb up towards Les Arcs. First ever time the Tour has finished at Les Arcs, which always surprises me. We're in the parallel uh, valley to Val Torrance, where we've been before. As the attacks are now trying to come away from the main field here. But you know, the leaders have got themselves together today. They've just tested one another out, but they've kept themselves basically together. Uh, that's Luc Leblanc who seems to be moving up for an attack. He's gone straight up to the front and Luc Leblanc going clear. This little man, a very ungainly style on a bike, but he is a very star climber indeed. Won the stage of the Tour at Otokam back in 1994. Most consistent Tour de France rider. Has only worn the yellow jersey for one occasion only. He did it back in 1991. But he finished fourth in 94. Now he's back having missed last year when the Groupement disbanded the team. He's gone straight by Laurent Dufault and there was no fight left in Dufault. I think he really did hit the wall. He didn't look too good when he was chatting there with his team manager. And the pace, no real reaction here. No suicide runs on this first day in the Alps. Indurain looking good at the front. The Spanish flag, or rather the Belgian flag there, being shown to a Swiss rider and a counter-attack here. Now here's a man that everybody already is beginning to talk about and this is the rider from the Carrera squad Lutenberger first Tour de France for him I saw him race in South Africa as an amateur he's a superb climber he's gone straight up to the side of Richard Berenko rather Richard Berenko has come up behind Lutenberger and because he doesn't want him to get too much of a lead Leblanc is the man on the attack and we often see that whenever a Frenchman attacks a Berenko is likely to follow he likes to be the number one Frenchman. He's been the winner of the King of the Mountains for the last two years. And by the way, the King of the Mountains today has been well dropped at Leon Van Bon. As Luc Leblanc heads up towards the finish at Les Arc, ironically now in the sun. What a day this has turned out to be. The King of the Mountains has been dropped. We have seen the yellow jersey abandoned. We've known of one bad crash uh, to Johan Brunil, who has climbed back on his bike. And now we're heading up towards the finish here, and the race is beginning to fragment. Alex Zula, now 28 years of age, as we head up towards the 32nd birthday of Miguel Indurain, and that's Zula and Indurain. Indurain has been dropped here, 
This is not the going forward part of the group, this is the going backward part of the group. Miguel Indurain has been passed by Alex Zula. Indurain is in trouble and that is something we have never seen during the last five tours. Miguel Indurain is in trouble here. He's being tailed off by Zula. There are plenty of riders ahead and in fact he has called for a drink. Now it's not allowed to accept a drink at this stage of the race under the race regulations. If he takes anything, he will be fined. He'll get a small time penalty. I think the first offence is 10 seconds. And in fact, uh, the drink offered there by, it wasn't from his team car. He took one look at it and threw it away. So maybe the referees will turn a blind eye on that. As we go up to the leader, the man here who is setting the pace, he will not know the drama that's going on behind him. We have actually seen uh, Miguel Indurain crack on a mountain stage. Maybe the weather really did get to him. But Luc Leblanc is stamping on those pedals and heading up towards the finish now at Les Arc. And he's, he's going to win the stage just like he did at Otakam. This is going to be a great return for Luc Leblanc. And he would have been so high up the overall classification. But for that first aid crash when we saw him lying on the right hand side of the road. It really did look on that first day that his Tour de France was over. It's turned right around now. Luc Leblanc comes to the line and takes the great victory at Les Arc. And he comes up punches the sky so Leblanc is back he's gaining time too on an awful lot of riders as the second man up the climb now as he punches the pedals in fact if Dufault was hanging on there he's only just been caught inside the line Tony Rominger is the rider who's gone through and Richard Varenk is up behind his teammate teammate Laurent Dufault but it's going to be another surprise Tony Rominger is going to get second place Around about 45 seconds behind Luc Leblanc, Rominger gets second. And that will give him a good morale for the rest of the race. Uh, getting second in the mountains first day out. Luterberger gets the third slice. Ferenc is fourth. Dufault hung on, hung on for fifth. And Abraham Olano gets sixth. But here's the story of the day. They've all crossed the line on top of the mountain, including now the pink jersey of Alex Azula. While behind, we have Miguel Indurain in all sorts of... Look at the clock. Three and a half minutes to Zula. And it's still counting to Miguel Indurain. You know, this man could have lost the Tour de France on this one bad day in the Alps. He's clearly hit the wall. He's been unhappy with the weather. The weather has been atrocious, but it's come good here at Les Arcs. Maybe he's finished up with too many clothes on. He's hyperventilated, but whatever the reason, Miguel Indurain today appears human and he's never done that for the past six years of the Tour de France five times a winner since 1991 he is going to cross the line over four minutes behind the winner he has conceded an awful lot today Miguel Indurain his sixth Tour de France you've got to say it is now in serious doubt and I'm not surprised that Luc Leblanc is ecstatic so LeBlanc, no yellow jersey yet for him, but look at this, Laurent Jalabert even further behind than Miguel Indurain and not looking at all well. And the arrival too of Chris Boardman, he's also finished off the back, and what on earth has happened? And then I just completely blew for no apparent reason, I've been eating plenty, weight's been stable, I just completely blew, and you can see it in pulse, 150 maximum I was riding at instead of 170 or 180, and... Uh, when that happens, then it's just finished. So I really crawled up the uh, the um, the second climb with uh, Prudencio Injuran, Injuran, but the wrong one. <laughs> and uh, the last climb, we just rode up. I mean, it's you know half an hour, 35 minutes. It's it's neither here nor there. When it's finished. It's finished. I mean, you you said you blew. How bad did you feel? Well, how far was it down? <laughs> At the end? 20, 20 odd minutes, but I mean, Indurain lost four, minutes. Jalabert lost 18. Oh, yeah. it's, it's obviously been a hard day for a lot yeah, of people. Yeah, yeah. Um, to be honest, if it's 20 odd minutes, I'm absolutely gobsmacked. It's only that, you know, the way we were riding for the final. So it's, you know, it's not finished. I said I'm going to Paris and it's going to take more than today to stop me. It was an incredibly hard day. I had so many friends uh, on the route today, especially the last climb. When you're going well, there's nothing better than having friends there. It makes it a real euphoric experience. When you're going bad, there's nothing worse. Did, did you recover towards the end of the stage? Because when you came in, you seemed fine. That's because we didn't do the last climb uh, flat out. We rode it real steady the last climb. 
because <laughs> it's a bit of a cliche, it's a court, it's a race of three weeks and uh, today's one, one day. So if I was finished today, as I say, I lose half an hour, I lose 35 minutes, it's, it's right here, neither here nor there. And, and no thoughts of um, your future in the Tour? Well, I'll uh, have a good look at the uh, classment tonight, um, have a good think about tomorrow, I'll speak with the boss. I'm really, really, really disappointed. I can't think of a worse day on a bike than I've had today. Uh, but I'm just, I just have to get over it. As I'm sure Chris Bourbon will, but the Tour de France really is a tough event. That is the stage result, and what a sensational day. Romy are getting second, Lutenberg a third, but the big news, of course, the demise of Miguel Indurain, as Luc Leblanc here waves to the crowd. Overall, Olano in a similar situation to he was in the Giro. Tied on time here with another Russian, this time Evgeny Berzin. And it is Berzin now who's fulfilling his promise and looks like becoming a real threat in this year's Tour de France as he gets his first maillot jaune and pulls it on. I'm not surprised it's long sleeves either. It's still very, very chilly on the Tour de France. And the King of the Mountains, a traditional wearer of the jersey, this Richard Varenk, who's now in the hot seat again. But there was no hiding, you know, for Miguel Indurain as Gary Imlac went in search of him on the eve of the time trial, which would take us to Val d'Isere. 159 rides at the start, 39 have now abandoned, and the man in trouble, well, there's no doubt who that was, Miguel Indurain. Imlac went to his hotel, and he found it was the same hotel as many of the top names. It wasn't the best piece of advance booking as far as Bonesto were concerned, especially as all the teams were lumped together in one dining room. But as first Berzine and then Rominger turned up to date their places at the table, there was no sign of the man whose place they were trying to take in the race. And after a couple of false alarms turned out to be brother Prudencio and second placed Abraham Alano, it became clear that Mig had opted for room service, probably delivered intravenously. Rominger, though, at least, was taking no pleasure in the great man's fallibility. Paul, look, I'm not a big favourite for the Tour de France. It's still other guys who can win the Tour de France. You know, you saw today in three kilometers you can lose three minutes. That can also happen to me. Finally, Mig materialized to face the press conference mics and admitted that the weather was giving him problems. Afterwards, though, he played down to us the extent of his suffering on the stage. No, the etapa ha ido bien. Durante toda la etapa ha ido bien y tenía intención hasta de atacar al final. Pero eso me ha venido de repente y ahí es sufrir no porque no tenía fuerzas para, para poder sufrir mucho sino intentar coger el ritmo y llegar hasta arriba hasta meta how much of his strength he's regained we'll obviously find out today but although Indurain may have made the tour less of a foregone conclusion on the evidence of last night he's determined that when it comes the conclusion itself will be the usual one and Gary Imlac may well be right because few people believe they've seen the last of Miguel Indurain not with his reputation here he is on the start line at Borg San Maurice he now lies 14 to 3 minutes 32 seconds behind the new leader, Evgina Berzin of Russia. Chris Borbman is setting the trend. He's just called Domino Diaz Zabella. And he is now the fastest rider at the 24 kilometers check. But of course, there are the other leaders of the tour are still to make their start. The arrival now of Chris Borbman. And this will be the best time thus far as Borbman crosses the line. His time of 54 minutes and 23 seconds, so the great British time trialist is living up to his reputation uh, yet again. And out on the course, now let's have a look at the 13 riders behind Indurain, but he's got the best time, six seconds better than Chris Boardman. But Boardman's at the finish, and you know he should be pleased with his ride. Yeah, I wanted to give it a good go so I could... Uh, Merci pour le direct. <coughs> so I could... Uh, <coughs> see where I stand against the others. Uh, I rode very con consistent right the way through. Not my better, but not the best I can be, but uh, I was happy that it was constant all the way through and I had a good sprint uh, at the end there. So, uh, uh, <coughs> if I'm in the top five, I'll be relatively happy after yesterday. Well, back out on the road here, Bjorn Rees of Denmark who is a rider who has had in the past very high finishes, fifth in 1993, the first real time we heard of him. And again, the champion of Denmark. He's doing good checkpoint time, but so too is this man, Miguel Indurain. Reese is behind Indurain. Indurain is now the new marker, and I never thought I'd say that. He's usually the man that sets the mark that nobody will beat, but because of his early start today, he will have to wait and find out if others are going as well. Look at this now. 
in Jermaine is 36 seconds quicker than the marks being set or have been set by Chris Boardman. Tony Rominger lower down the slopes. The actual climb of Val d'Isere doesn't start early on. The roads drag a little bit and then it goes up. Intermediate time at 9.3 kilometres. Jan Ulrich is beginning to throw a spanner in the works here. Gone through seven seconds quicker than Miguel Injurain. Ulrich in his first tour. He's only a youngster on the telecom team and that is a big surprise. Well, here comes Alex Zula and already he's slower than Miguel Injurain and approaching the time of Bourbon. He slots in in second place behind Big Mig at the 15.7 kilometre check. So perhaps Indurain has recovered overnight. He said his tour wasn't over at his press conference. Laurent Jalabert, though, well, maybe his tour is. Look at these times for Jalabert. If he really did have thoughts on a yellow jersey in Paris, they're fading fast now. Only 14th, 57 minutes and 49 seconds at the finish for Jalabert. Out on the course, they're all through the first check. Berzin, the leader, has got the best time. That's what he would want. 16 seconds to Ulrich and Alano, 18 seconds in third. Rominger is fourth. That's at the check at 9.3 kilometers. That's the easy bit of the course. Tony Rominger there. Now we're back to the walls to finish here as Miguel Injurain is facing a picture of pain. Trying to prove to himself, above all, that he is coming back into the frame. He's going to be fastest when he reaches the line. He has made good time over Boardman over this serious part of the climb. Into Val Lizer, best time for Indurain, a 52-54. Almost one and a half minutes quicker than Boardman. Sweeping up, out on the course, Evgeny Berzin, the man in yellow. Look at the crowd here. It has been freezing cold standing on the slopes of this mountain today. Yet all of these people have waited to catch a glimpse of the new Mayu Jean of the Tour. Evgeny Berzin, just 30 and a half kilometres, but what a painful run it is. Jan Ulrich now, 25 seconds off the lead. And this is a rider who is turning in one of the big surprises of the Tour. He has stayed well to the line. He is just going to be slower than Indurain. His time as he comes up to the line. Now arriving Lutenberger, who's already come in. He's got second. Ulrich is now second. Indurain is still the leader. Ulrich down by only six seconds on Miguel Indurain. Bjorn Arise. Well, Reese might have a problem on his hands and he may not realise it, coming from his own teammate Jan Ulrich, who has turned in such a great time trial. Now, what about Reese? He's also approaching the time of injury. This looks like it might be a great start for Reese. He is going to take a lot of encouragement from the fact that injury dropped yesterday and now Bjorn Reese is in. His time is 52.28. He is 26 better, 26 seconds better than Miguel Indurain. So Bjorn Arise is a serious tour contender this year. There's no doubt about that now. Tony Rominger, who needs a good ride today, but it doesn't look as though it's coming. 52 seconds off the pace at 24 kilometers. Rominger, who went to the United States in the Tour du Pont, where he trained specifically for the Tour de France, he has concentrated on this race this year, and I'm not so sure that the legs are performing quite as he wanted them to. Indurain now down to second behind Rees as Rominger comes up to the line. He is going to be very close to the time of Indurain as the line approaches. He will finish in 52.54 for Rominger. And I make that the same time as Miguel Indurain, but it will be split by fractions of a second. The world champion, second in the world championship time trial behind Indurain, Alano. Again, he's running close to the man who beat him to the rainbow jersey in Colombia. And Indurain, it's time 52-54. Alana will beat him this time. 52-38 by just 10 seconds. Now, Evgeny Berzin, the only man left to finish here. Is he going to take it out with the best possible answer? The Mayo Jean winning at the time trial stage of the Tour de France. And that will take him on into the mountains tomorrow. The first really big hard climbs of this tour. They're all waiting literally over the hill here. As Berzin comes to the line, it's going to be the best time. And it's going to be a great time for Evgeny Berzin. He pushes the time of Bjorn Arise. He is going to be the only man inside. 52 minutes, he does it. 51-53, 35 seconds better than Bjorn Arise of Denmark. 
And we look down on the beautiful ski station of Val d'Azur. Well, it's normally beautiful anyway, but we're still waiting for the sun. Let's have a look at this result. Evgeny Berzin of Russia and Gaywiz gets the win ahead of Bjorn Aris of Denmark. Abraham Olano is third. Miguel Injurain, is he on the way back? Same time as Rominger, finishing fifth. Overall, the leader of the tour increases his overall lead to 43 seconds over Bjorn Aris. What a day. Well, the weather has closed in, the rain coming, thank heavens, after the race had finished. But over my shoulder is the giant climb of the Col de Liseron. That's the way for the Tour de France tomorrow into the finish of Sestria in Italy. The forecast is not good. This is turning out to be an amazing Tour de France. Well, this is what the Tour de France used to be like in the good old days. The riders enjoying hot sunshine, the crowds enjoying their day out and watching a great free spectacle. But not today, because all of the fears have been realised. The Col de Galibier is being swept by what the French are describing as a veritable tempest, with winds blowing up to 70 miles an hour. The riders cannot possibly cross over the mountain. In fact, I've spoken to one or two club cyclists who did try to come up here, and literally, they've been suffering for hypothermia on the descent. Richard Varenk heading to sign on, knowing he's going to sign on and step into a motor car, because the decision has been taken to cancel the Col de Galibier and the Col de Liseron, and instead the riders taken to the other side of the Alps, to the town of Le Monentier les bains where the race stage will now only be 46 kilometres, and it's going to last about one hour and ten minutes. But you know, when you have short stages, you often have difficult ones. At Sestria, let's remind ourselves of 1952. Fausto Coppi having a great tour this year. He also won at Alpe d'Huez, uh, which is not too far away. Also in the Alps, but they're in the French Alps. Sestria in the Italian Alps. And just uh, a couple of years ago, in 1992, this was the arrival of the great Claudio Chiapucci after a fantastic escape over the mountains watched throughout the day on television. But as we join the action now, we are on the climb of Mont Ginevra, a second category climb coming straight after the start. I'm sorry about the quality of the pictures, but our helicopters have actually had difficulty in getting round the Alps to bring us any pictures at all because of the poor weather conditions. But the attack on the climb of Mont Ginevra has come from Bjorn Aris of Denmark and as I said earlier, 46 kilometres is not a long way, but you know, when it's a short distance, it's a matter of pure strength. And Bjorn Aris has decided to go for gold right from the gun today. And what is happening here is that nobody is willing to help the yellow jersey of Evgeny Berzin. Abraham Olano is just behind him and not assisting in the pace at all. Richard Varenka, Escartin. Miguel Ingerain is up in the move again, which is nice to see. Ten kilometres to the summit now. We've moved on to the lower slopes of Sestria. And still we're waiting to see anybody take up the race here and help Berzin. He's finding the pressures of having a yellow jersey on his shoulder now rather hard. Well, Bjorn restarted the day 43 seconds away from yellow. The last time check we got, his lead was up to 50 seconds. If he continues this progress, there's no time bonuses now at the finishing line. It means he would indeed be the yellow jersey. I think, you know, Berzin sat up there as if he to say, I've had enough of this, you either help me or we'll all lose the race. And I think that's the answer because he's got back in the saddle. I thought he was blowing up. But he's got back in and fallen in behind Abraham Olano. But the speed here now of Bjorn Arisa being driven on by the thought he could be in yellow. That would be a great triumph for the Danish champion as well. He's under the five kilometres banner now. So Rees is a rider who knows he's on a mission. He promised his team he would do his best to win the Tour de France if they gave him a 100% commitment. They did and now it's down to him. 49 seconds the gap. So it's holding. At the moment, he's in yellow by six seconds. Evgeny Berzin hasn't lost it yet, because normally one goes quicker towards the finish. They're under the five-kilometre banner. Olano now having to help Berzin, because he's realised the danger of the great escape here by the Danish rider. Rees, who came to his first Tour de France in 1989, we didn't really notice him. He finished 95th overall. He never finished the Tour in 1990, and he was 107th in 1991 and then his whole career changed direction he missed the tour in 92 when he came back in 1993 he won a stage he was briefly the king of the mountains leader 
and he also finished fifth overall and right now he's in search of a yellow jersey yet again he's worn it once before in 1995 well this is a defiant ride by Reese. once that stage took out the two big mountains because you know on the eve of this stage riders like Richard Brink were saying to everybody the Tour de France would be decided today over the two big mountains of the Tour but they didn't know the snow would say otherwise and this is my 24th Tour de France and I have never seen snow falling on the cols in any of those 24 years and Berzine feeling the pressures of the day. The Maillot Jaune, everybody wants it, and when you've got it, everybody can't keep it. Berzine having to set the tempo. Olano has gone back into second place. Lutenberger, by the way, in there, I've just spoken of him. There he is, he's putting an attack. Lutenberger, the climber from Austria. The Austrians are expecting something special about this young man. He's a very talented mountain climber. He's now pushing on as he breaks away here, just won the Tour of Switzerland. But oddly enough, riders who do ride well in the Tour of Switzerland very rarely have a great Tour de France. Perhaps it's the proximity of the two races. Lutenberger, however, now testing the King of the Mountains leader, Richard Varenk, who looks pretty cool at the minute. Udo Bolt is in this league group as well, so too the strong newcomer Jan Ulrich. Telecom have one man in the lead and two men here. They are doing themselves plenty of favours for the team race as well. Alano in a spot of bother and I don't see the yellow jersey either. Alano has gone off to our right and I think you know the Berzin has gone off as well. Escartine is 181. Rominger is hanging on grimly to the back of this group which is being stirred up by Miguel Indurain. No other Indurain at the front, Lutenberger back in the pack, the gap is enough now to give Bjorn Aris the yellow jersey, Indurain trying to take control of a furs again, two days after he hit the wall at Les Arcs. Well we've come round the snow today and Indurain hasn't got anything like the clothing on he had on his climb to Les Arcs, no gloves either, and perhaps he's feeling that little bit better. Everybody had to feel sorry for Indurain at Les Arcs. Nobody likes to see a champion struggle. Nobody had seen him really suffer previously. Further up the climb, Bjorn Arise, the next candidate for the hot seat. He heads up under two kilometres to go. His legs protected just to keep the chill off those leg muscles. The riders always worry about the likelihood of tendonitis and the kneecaps. Indurain, Lutenberger, but you know, Yellow has gone. He's not in this group at all. We didn't see him go, but he's gone. So Evgeny Berzin falling away from perhaps the top two or three places overall here. Luc Leblanc also trying to put in a little bit of a special ride on this climb and recover a bit. He's just gone clear of the group, in fact. Leblanc is second man on the slopes now as we head up into the town of Sestria. We're in Italy, don't forget, but it's not an Italian. There's only ever been Italian winners of the Tour de France here. Fausto Coppi, Claudio Chiapucci. Now they're going to see the champion of Denmark because Bjorn Aris is under one kilometre to go. It's the time that will matter. Although, frankly, I think he's got all the time he needs now because the yellow jersey has been dropped off the back of the chase group. Luc Leblanc is closing in pretty rapidly, whether he'll get on, it's uh, debatable. What a courageous rider Luc Leblanc is, the French love him for it. He never lets anybody have a peaceful ride, if he's got half a chance he'll go for it. And Indurain has been left to do all of the pacemaking over these last few kilometres and that's why a rider like Leblanc has found the strength to jump around him and get clear. Rominger behind Indurain. He reminds me, he reminds me a lot of Jupp Zutemelk, Tony Rominger. Tends to follow wheels rather than put in decisive attacks. Third place is Richard Varenk. Jan Ulrich. This rider's never seen the Tour de France, only on television. And look at him now. Bolts in a spot of bother, tagged onto the back, as is Escartine. Ulrich has gone too. They're almost on to Luc Leblanc, but here's the man who's won the day. He's led since the lower slopes of Mont Genevre. A climb which, by the way, was used in the Giro d'Italia this year as well. And now the Dane Bjorn Aris comes to the line for the stage victory. 
And Bjorn Lloris, last one to stay to the Tour de France at Albi in 1994, at Chalon sur in 93, and now Sestrier in 96. Watch the clock. Luc Leblanc will get second place. And Leblanc, well, will he get second place? Because, in fact, Richard Varenk is closing in very quickly on him. Leblanc is just about flat out for the line. Yes, he will. Leblanc gets second place. The time saying he's 24 seconds down, about 26 seconds back to Varenk. And then comes Rominger, just pipping Indurain into the line. And then the rest are following. Udo Boltz being challenged by Federic Escar team. We are still waiting for the arrival of the Mayo Jean. And looking down the road there, it is not in sight. Oh, here he comes. Almost a minute has gone by as the Mayo Jean of Evgeny Berzin comes into sight. And Bjorn Aric can now wash his face and get ready for his yellow jersey because the Russian rider has lost it today to Bjorn Aric of Denmark. He's losing time, but maybe not enough time to cost him second place overall. As he comes up to the line, he is going to finish. Look at the time for the stage. One hour, ten minutes. <laughs> As Luc Leblanc gets second overall, Rhys Varenk, Rominger, Indurain and Boltz, the Mayo Jean today, uh, does finish 14th, a minute and 23 seconds back. And Bjorn Rhys is the new overall leader of an amazing Tour de France. Rhys now leading Berzin by 40 seconds, Rominger is third and Abraham Olano is fourth. Further down the list, Indurain climbing back, he's now up to eighth. And at last, the sun has discovered the Tour de France at the town which boasts 300 days a year of sunshine here in Gap. And as the riders make their way from Italy, there's no doubt who these people are going to support when Bjarne Ries comes into the finish. The race is 209 kilometres today, coming out of Turin, down to Gap, over the mountains. And we left Gary Imlach back at the start in Turin. And just 157 riders rolling away from Turin. The race hasn't been there for 30 years. And this a very sad sight. He's been yo-yoing off the back all day. Laurent Jalabert saying he has a fever, has abandoned the Tour de France. And that is a big disappointment for the French. But that is the way this year's tour is going. Big names are falling out, or in the case of Miguel Indurain, dropping back. The happiness of the world's number one just a year ago when he won on Bastille Day and won the green jersey and finished fourth overall, nothing but a memory. This is Andrea Ferragato passing through our lenses here. It's been a battle all day between Eric Zorbel and Frédéric Moncassin for the points for the green jersey competition. Zorbel winning both of the sprints so far. But now we have a small group here trying to slip away from the field. As we run down towards the finishing gap and the beauty of the Alps are now all around us. It's a beautiful warm summer's day. There's where we are approaching the climb, a little climb it is of the Col de la Sentinelle and from that leading breakaway Rolf Sorensen has gone. The opportunist Rolf Sorensen, he usually pops up and goes for gold at some stage and Sorensen remember beat Neil Stevens, the Australian for a stage win at Montpellier a couple of years ago. The top of the Col de la Sentinelle, it's uh, not a particularly high Col, it's only third category, uh, but what a springboard for the downhill sprint now. It's 10 kilometres straight down now into Gap, and then a steady, very steady drag up to the finishing line in the city. A city which they say gets so much sun you hardly ever see rain, and so it's proving today. Richard Varenk getting more points on that third category climb. He won the climb of the Col de Mont Ginevre today. The early roads today, very familiar to the riders who rode in the Tour of Italy this year. Now the chase down, if they can catch him, because everybody else has been swept up. Varenk led over the main field there, there's only this man staying away, but just watch Jones on this descent here. Uh, clipping the grass verges as he gives everything on the way down. The roads in the area, ideal for touring cyclists. Uh, not too many cars, in fact virtually none, and terrific uh, roads for touring, but Sorensen is taking just about every risk possible here. He just about braked hard enough to pull his bike round from that bend. They are closing in on him. Oh, and are they closing in on him? 12 seconds is the gap. And it's the telecom team who are riding hard. Even Bjorn Aris of Telecom is up there now because, you know, they could go into the rest day tomorrow as leader on both the yellow and the green jersey competitions if they can get Zorbel into a high finish down at the end. Five kilometres from the finish, they're trying to chase down Rolf Sorensen and give Zorbel a shot at gold. 
Bruno Kengialta is out on the attack, trying to reach Ross Sorensen first. He's got no interest in the progress of German Telecom. The pink jersey of Onse, rather strangely being forced into a backseat role this year after dominating the race last year. But they've seen their team leader go out today and I don't quite know how they will handle that, but Jalabert has gone. He's like Motorola now, the Onse, because they lost Motorola, lost Armstrong very early on in this year's Tour de France. Now, can they wheel in Rolf Sorensen? He has a habit of hanging on. He's a great lone break expert. He's under the one kilometre to go. Banner, and they're right there. They are almost on him now as Pat Yonker launches an attack straight off the front of the field as well. The Australian rider with the Dutch name on the Spanish team. They're right close, but really, Rolf must not look around now. Just dig deep and hope he survives as the finishing line approaches. Rolf Sorens, and there he is on the right of our picture. The main field are closing in so very, very quickly now. Richard Varenk is still up there in the action. Laurent Dufault, I think it is, who's trying to end the hopes of Sorensen. He might get there. He sat up as he looks at the sprinters. They're right on him now. Abdu Jafarov is coming through as well, but Eric Zabel has got the front. This could be a perfect finish for Telecom. Eric Zabel, Abdu Jafarov as they come to line. Fedegato is tucked in there as well. Baldato too. Eric Zabel gets the victory, Abdu Japarov slaps his handlebars and that win will give a green jersey to Eric Zabel who has now got two wins in this year's Tour de France as he did last year when he won at Bordeaux and Charleroi, he's now won at nogent sur oise and Gap and this one I'm sure will give Zabel green. Fedegato third, Baldato fourth and there it is, the green jersey on the eve of the rest day to Eric Zabel and the yellow is on the shoulders of his teammate Bjorn Rees. Evgeny Berzin still second and Rominger is third. Miguel Ingerain, no improvement today, no change at all overall on the rest day in the Alps. And so the riders now move on to stage number 11. The aching legs eased a little bit by the rest day in the Alps. The battle for the green jersey still centering between Zabel and Moncassin and Eric Zabel now building a lead over the Frenchman and Baldato there in third place. Zabel opening with a win at La Roche des Arnaud after 11 kilometres today. 28 degrees Celsius, that's a bit better. The westerly winds are blowing and it is warm and sunny. A few small hills and no really steep ones are called the Cabra. The second category climb at 47 kilometres has been won by Richard Varenk from Laurent Brochard and uh, Manyan getting the third place there. The riders are more or less staying nicely tightly packed. But one name we've had to say goodbye to, the British rider Max Chandry has pulled out. And that is a shame but uh, let's hope he has better luck at the upcoming Atlanta Olympic Games. Lord Madras at Motorola. Motorola really could do with a little result now as this breakaway has started to get itself clear of the field. This breakaway attacking on the climb of the Col de la Show. And the telecom team, led by the big rider Rolf Aldag, now uh, having to conduct the chase down, not just for the yellow, but for the points jersey as well. The rider on the far side of Madras there, he's in the championship of Spain colours, Fernandez Ginez. He is the best rider in the breakaway, lying in 18th place overall but 11 minutes and 4 seconds behind Bjarne Ries so the job of the German telecom team there really is to keep this break under control but not to worry over much if it gains a couple of minutes on the day because there's nobody to damage the lead on the road to Valence yet of Bjarne Ries big test though for the yellow jersey as always in the Tour de France an attack here from Laurent Brochard trying to break away from this rather unmanageable group of some 10 riders and Brochard has ridden a very aggressive Tour de France so far and hasn't been rewarded with a good result at the end he was the rider who went over the top of Jan Zverada in the stage finish that eventually led to the retirement of the Czech Republic rider and Brochard back in the group all the riders back together once more And thin down to just eight men now amongst the riders being dropped to Tilly Bourguignon as we swing round and line up towards the finish in Valence and again another attacker has gone so charging off the front there that looks like it is uh, Jose Gonzalez the Colombian rider for Kelme 
It's very unusual to see a clubby rider in the kill in any case in a race that hasn't involved an uphill finish and he's actually caught them completely off guard that nobody I think expected the Colombian rider to attack. Well Kel may come to this race every year, invariably go away with one stage win. They too lost their team leader uh, in Holland on that opening stage when Hernan Buena Hora uh, crashed. He went out of the tour having finished 10th last year and now there's a chance of some real consolation here. This will be a big surprise. Uh, Gonzalez uh, doesn't win any races outside of Colombia and now he's got his big chance. There's still no reaction from that group. The group behind is watching and waiting but they haven't come up at all yet and he might well hang on here. It's a slight rise to the finish so perhaps the advantage will swing back to the Colombian. His nickname is Kepi as he comes in towards the finishing line now this is going to be a great result for Gonzalez he's going to give Colombia a very very rare finish indeed I think we can just about call it a sprint finish Rochard starts the reaction Fernandez Ginez he goes on to the right of our picture and uh, Eli is also trying to get on the picture but it's too late Kepi Gonzalez gets the victory in second place will be Fernandez Ginez champion of Spain there will be a time gap between them as the main field comes home here the battle for the points continue. Baldato in the middle and Eric Zabel is proving just too fast for everybody at the moment and he gets some points as he finishes a little way down the field there. Well, there is the happy picture of today's stage of the Tour de France. Uh, Jose Kepi Gonzalez of Colombia and Kelme gets the victory in this 202 kilometer race in five hours and nine minutes. And overall, though, there's no change at all. Rhys Berzin and Rominger. And the sun continues to shine as we now head towards the Ardèche. Today is the 12th day of racing for the riders in the Tour de France. There are 151 of them still survive of the 198 who signed in in Holland. And the three Australians are still there. Pat Yonker, Neil Stevens, and Scott Sunderland as well. Overall, the lead is held by the Dane Bjorn Arise. He's 40 seconds in front of Evgeny Berzin and Tony Rominger is third. Now, before we go out on the road to Le puy en velay a ride of 89 miles through stunning scenery today, let's join Paul Sherwin, who's going to tell us more about the German telecom team. Team Telecom have undergone a remarkable transformation over the last 12 months. In 1995, they were surprised and disappointed to only get selection for the Tour de France in a mixed team with ZG Mobile. Despite only having six members in the race, they still came away with two stage victories for Eric Zabel. The addition of Bjarne Ries during the winter and the emergence of rising star Jan Ulrich has changed the outlook of the team. The confidence of 32-year-old Ries has proved instrumental in the change of attitude of the telecom team. After finishing fifth and third in the last two tours, his message was he can win the Tour de France. Yeah, actually he said it even in the winter time, you know, when we met him first time and uh, we had a team meeting in November and he signed a contract and he was like okay my my only goal is to win the Tour de France and everybody was a little bit uh, well yes uh, we try to help as good as we can but uh, and then yeah we had a team meeting again at the first stage in in, in the Netherlands and uh, I he stood up and he said okay this is a team I think it's a really good team and if you do everything for me, I try to do everything to win the tour and I really hope we can work really good together and everybody was still a little bit, ah, well, maybe, maybe not, but, uh, you know, we got to believe him anyway. I mean, he's the team leader. For the moment, Reese is keeping his word. He's currently leading the race by 40 seconds. But Team Telecom also have Eric Zabel leading the green jersey competition and rising star Jan Ulrich lying in fifth place. This kind of success is pushing the levels of endurance even higher especially for the team workers who have to respond to all the attacks, keeping Bjarne Reese in their slipstream so that he can conserve as much energy as possible for the great battles that lie ahead in the mountains. And the telecom team really do have the work cut out now, but what a marvellous tour they are having. On the Col de la Chant now at 82 and a half kilometres covered, and this uh, a climb of some 16 kilometres, second category and a little breakaway settling in nicely now. It went clear right out at the start today on the Côte du Pin after some 10 kilometres. And in this breakaway we have Danny Nellison sitting at the back. Also here Laurent Roux of the TVM team and his teammate Jesper Skibby. The gap is slowly building. In fact in that breakaway there are six nations represented and seven different teams. And with seven teams up there it's unlikely 
that this breakaway will be caught. There's nobody in it who are going to seriously affect the overall standings. Jesper Skibby lies 30th overall, but he's almost 28 minutes back. And Pascal Richard, that was the rider just sitting off the back there riding no-handed. He's 44 minutes off the pace from Switzerland. And so it's a day that the telecom team are not going to commit suicide, try to chase down that breakaway. They'll leave it to others if they want to attack. And we move on now to the second sprint at Le Mostier sur Gazeille. And this second sprint coming at about uh, 124 kilometres into the stage. And it's been won by Laurent Roux ahead of Eric Broikink and Jesper Skibby. The breakaway still clear. Now, this is a great pastime if you've got a head for heights. And if you haven't, well, that's how to get rid of it. As the race goes by, well timed, as the leaders have gone by, our little friend on the bungee has dived off the top of that beautiful aqueduct or viaduct, I think it was, as we're watching now an attack here by Laurent Roux, who's trying to get away, but there is a reaction. Laurent Roux has been quite a find in the race this year for TVM, and we're now in the area where he lives. Another account attack from the onset, that Melchor Maori is digging deep as well. But people are paying attention in this breakaway as they try to uh, just keep a tight control. Look at that for the peloton in a long, long, thin line. They are beginning to pick up the pace a little bit now. The gap is down to around about 13 minutes, so they are closing in, believe it or not. As we're now seeing Pascal Richard. Now this rider is an opportunist, if ever there was one. A chance to break away for Richard, he'll always take it. Uh, quickly marked by Danny Nellison, but this breakaway under pressure now. Eric Broikings number 83. And the Palti rider, Merico Gualdi, trying to get onto the back wheel. It looks as though this move by Richard has failed. Nellison has caught him, the current world amateur champion. The last time we will see that title because now it's pure open racing as we will see in the upcoming Olympic Games in Atlanta. And the bliss is the bunch here passing under the banner at Le Monestier Sugazai. Not interested in the points either for the green jersey because there are only the first three riders over the line receive points. And this field just about trying to penetrate uh, something into the inroads of the big lead built up by that leading group of some nine men. Melchior Mary nears the camera in the pink. Far side, uh, Rolf Sorensen. The pace being set by Pascal Richard. And now we're deep into the heart of Le Puy. A beautiful town, this a nasty little... Uh, a surprise for the riders over these few, last few kilometres. Very undulating roads indeed. Good opportunity to split this breakaway up, but they haven't been able to do that. Two kilometres to go to the finishing line now. And this looks as though it's going to go down to a tight sprint finish. As the riders are settling in for what is certain to be a sprint now. Yes, but Skibby, the TVM boys have got all the riders here to handle the affair if they can get it together. And Danny Nellison, who's tried hard from day one to win a stage. Skibby's got his back wheel. Richard is coming as well, Nelson is going for it now, Skibby dreaming of it, and on the far right is Pascal Richard, Richard can he read the brakes this rider, when he gets in them he usually finishes it off with a victory, he's going to get the win, Pascal Richard, the last time he won a stage in the Tour de France, 1989 at Briançon, now he's got the victory, Pascal Richard, this is how he did it, and it came very, very easily in the end. This is Richard's sixth Tour de France since 1988. On three occasions, he's never reached the finish. But on another occasion, he did win a stage. Pascal Richard gets the victory. He finishes just in front of Jesper Skibby. And this is the main field coming in. And the best part of some 15 minutes has slipped by. Now, can Eric Zabel finish it off? He's lying on the wheels of the Gan Riders. In fact, he shot off our camera to the right, I think, Eric Zabel. And Zabel is, there he is, just tucked into the picture. He's going to win easily here. Zabel gets uh, some points towards that green jersey, and that could be a nice little bit of uh, safety in the bank for him. But it's looking pretty hot that he's going to win that jersey now. Overall, Richard is the winner. Jesper Skibby in the same time, and then a few tailed off in the sprint. Eric Broiking at three seconds, for example. Zabel bringing the peloton in some 15 minutes late. Bjorn Uris keeps his yellow jersey. Miguel Indurain lies in eighth place, by the way, and he is now four minutes 38 seconds behind. And it's now exactly a week since Miguel Indurain lost that time on the climb to Les Arcs, and during that week he's been a very quiet man in the peloton. 
Well, if he's going to win this tour, he's got to make his move pretty soon. So last night, Paul Schoen went to his hotel. Paul, who's ridden the Tour de France alongside Miguel Indurain, asked him the questions that we all want to know the answers to. Bon, Miguel, maintenant, il reste neuf jours pour le Tour de France. Est-ce que vous avez récupéré de la défaillance que vous avez eue la semaine passée? Sí, yo espero, ¿no? Espero el, el poder recuperar esa diferencia, sobre todo de la pájara de Lesart y la, y la contraló de Valdiser, es la, la máxima diferencia. Confío, sobre todo con el sol, que venga, que haga calor. Es una buena señal para mí, para mi músculo, que una semana bajo el agua, bajo el frío, pues están un poco todavía doloridos. Est-ce que c'était difficile de, de finir l'étape On vous avait vu beaucoup à la peine dans la, la dernière montée quand vous avez euh, explosé. Non, difficile à acabar, non Era une étape qui allait bien, qui allait avec eh, force. J'avais pensé à attaquer, parce que la Madeleine et le Roselan ont passé bien. Et j'avais pensé à attaquer les derniers 5 km, mais je ne sais pas le problème de frío, le problème de. Parce que comer et beber, j'ai fait bien. Donc, ça a été. En dos kilómetros he sentido las piernas mal, las piernas vacías, eh, no podía más. Eh, justo llegar a meta, eh, no sufrimiento porque no tenía fuerza, pero me costaba mucho y eh, veía que perdía tiempo. El soir, cuando vos habéis llegado, ¿es que vos étiez déçu o vos étiez fâché porque era la causa del tiempo o algo así? Un poco desilusionado, sí, porque he visto que el tour pues, está difícil. Cuatro, cinco minutos casi de tiempo, pero tenía, tengo que seguir trabajando. Eh, eh, al día siguiente he hecho una buena contraló, he hecho entre los primeros, no para ganar, porque el músculo estaba pues, bastante limpio de energía, pero he estado bien. Al día siguiente en Sestrier también he estado con el grupo de cabeza, entonces visto que no es problema físico, sino que es problema pues, de momento o de... Del frío o cualquier cosa, ¿no? Entonces, espero el poder recuperar. Y ahora, si bien eres el maillot jaune de la Tour de France, ¿cómo vos lo veis? Il est, por el momento, él es muy fuerte. Sí, va muy fuerte. También va el equipo Telecom, va muy fuerte. También tiene un sprinter, tiene grandes corredores y tiene un buen equipo de Riz, está bien. Ya ha hecho quinto en el Tour, ha hecho tercero el año pasado. Eh, es un corredor que está fuerte, se, se mueve bien en la crono, en la montaña, tiene experiencia y está con mucha ilusión. Entonces es el, el máximo rival en este momento. Pero es también difícil porque para el equipo Telecom es la primera vez que están en la posición de defender el maillot jaune. ¿Es que vos pensáis que un día ellos van a craquer? <laughs> espero, sí, espero que, que pasen problemas. El problema es que están defendiendo muy bien. Son profesionales, no han estado nunca en esa eh, cosa de defender un líder en el Tour de Francia, pero sí igual en otras carreras. Son profesionales, todos los corredores tienen ya una experiencia importante, pero el Tour siempre es diferente, entonces espero que un día paguen ese esfuerzo. ¿Es que vos habéis recuperado todas las fuerzas que vos avez, que vous avez normalmente en el mois de juillet? Voy recuperando, todavía el músculo tiene agua, tiene frío, está cada día un poco mejor con este buen tiempo eh, espero que conforme vayan pasando días y sobre todo en el marcio central a calor y, y sentirme bien el otro día he hablado con Pedro Delgado y me dijo yo estoy seguro que Miguel Indurain puede aún ganar el Tour de France ¿Vos êtes de cet avis? Hombre, está difícil, está complicado pero tengo ilusión estoy bien físicamente, no tengo problemas de catarro de de gripe, eso sí, y a seguir trabajando y esperar el momento oportuno para poder atacar al líder. And stage 13 on the 13th of July, Le Puy en Valais to Superbest Saucy. And Superbest is a nasty little climb to finish a long day of racing of 177 kilometers. A series of little hills will take the riders up to the final finishing line, and they really could be very decisive indeed. 
In the competitions, the green jersey on the shoulder at the moment of Eric Zabel, who is looking very strong in the sprints now. Frédéric Moncassin, from whom he took the jersey, is still challenging. In the King of the Mountains, Richard Varenk has no challenges, as indeed he is, has not had any challenges for the past three years, it seems. He's now set to complete a hat-trick of wins in the King of the Mountains, but of course the Pyrenees are still to come. But a breakaway today is spoiling Eric Zabel's progress in that race for the green jersey because it's been other riders snipping up the small bonuses and they have no interest in the point score at all. It's 14 riders here, they had a lead of over 5 minutes but they are being caught and there is plenty of chance now on the little stepping stones up to the finish at a super best, they will be wiped out. Number 148 is Paolo Salvadelli of the Roslotto team. But now, as Chris Boardman sets the pace at the front, uh, they are being picked up uh, by a strong chase back in the main field. Lolland Brochard is the rider third down the line. Claudio Chiapucci is in the move as well, but there is a strong reaction coming now. Stefano Catai to the right of our picture, Luc Leblanc at the head of this chase group here. And this is going to be a very interesting finish now because there is not a real chance of success and yet there is if you think about the fact that they've had the lead even though they're losing it now. Abraham Olano is in that group as well down there. The main field is completely fragmented under the pressure of what are very difficult roads here. They're heavy roads where the riders really can't get themselves a real shot at the finish at super best. The park team cars on the right now as the brake starts to get reeled in. Richard Varenk and Luc Leblanc are doing the damage. Varenk finding himself with few riders willing to come out and play in the high mountains. They just seem to surrender as soon as Varenk starts sprinting for the summit of the big peaks and he chips away at winning the small climbs as well which gives him such a commanding lead overall in the king of the mountains. There's Miguel Indurain Number one on the wheel of the yellow jersey of Bjorn Aris. Indurain having to come back to this group to, uh, after a puncture a little bit uh, earlier. But he did it very strongly. He seems to have completely recovered uh, from the problem he had. But he's still got an awful lot of time to make up. And Luc Leblanc is making sure he will try and steal a few more seconds. Because he's still looking for all the time he lost on the first day for a high overall finish in Paris. He just loves races which finish on top of mountains. Patrick Jonker coming back from the league group, just slipping away there. And LeBlanc passing another rider down on the inside as well. So the main field are now getting their way through. It's not really the main field, it's a very select advanced bunch. As riders are picked up one after another. The MG Techno Gym rider who's just been picked up is Mikola Bartoli who was also up front. Richard Varenk, a little bit ungainly when he's out of the saddle, but he certainly gets some speed out of that bicycle. And way in the distance is the finish at Superbess. A long way to go yet for the riders as Luc Leblanc determined to try and catch them, but the, uh, the lead car is getting a little bit in the way here. Up towards the front runners now, Rolf Sorensen, number 82, putting on a lot of the pressure. And it looks as though Luc Leblanc is getting across to the last two survivors of the breakaway. Rolf Sorensen is at the front and I'm not too sure who the other one is but it could be Claudio Chiapucci. And as we come up alongside, the rider in the lead is in fact Rodriguez of Bernesto. Just had the sort of crouched shoulders of Chiapucci there but it's not, it's uh, Orlando Rodriguez who was in the breakaway from the outset as the breakaway is thinned down to just these riders now. A great ride by Leblanc, the same two for Pascal Richard. They've reached the leaders. Sorensen, the crafty rider he is, is looking just to make sure who else might come across because he's wondered what happened to the breakaway that was all around him. And the rider who's also got up, Paolo Salvadelli. And quickly onto the, his wheel. There's only five of them left here now in the wide boulevard finish. Rolf Sorensen leading out. Sorensen, the rider who was robbed so cruelly at the finish at Gap when he was washed away to nowhere. What a great camera shot that was as he swings around. Very tortuous approach to the line here. There'll be a sharp left-hander. Here it comes. Sorensen round, followed by 
Rodriguez. Rodriguez in second place. Richard Varenk, who's come up to this league group, has seen his chance slip away. He sits up in disgust. Rolf Sorensen gets the victory. Rodriguez second. Varenk will have to be content with third. All given the same time. And Leblanc fourth. Now the race from the rest here. Chris Boardman has been joined by some of the elite now as he makes the corner first. Miguel Ingerain takes over the running from him. Bjorn Arise is in the group, so he loses no time. Not to the men that matter. Ingerain will get sixth and Boardman takes seventh. There's the stage result. Sorensen finishing ahead of Rodriguez and Veronk. LeBlanc gets the fourth place. So Rolf Sorensen deservedly gets his stage win as he did at Montpellier a couple of tours ago. Overall, Reese in front of Alano. And so to stage 14, Bastille Day in France a year ago. It was Laurent Jalabert in the green jersey who was winning the stage. He's now out of the tour, but Eric Zabel at Lac Chambon is continuing to add up the points in his lead in the jersey competition. His battle there with Frédéric Moncassin, who got the second place. It's a perfect day today, 30 degrees Celsius forecast, very, very hot, and really there is no wind at all as we join this breakaway uh, 20 kilometres from the finish. One scare during the day on the Col de la croix Morant. In fact, Veronque and Rees escaped on the descent, but common sense prevailed and the race regrouped at the front. We now have this breakaway that's trying to stay away, and I think it should stay away now until the finish. It's a question of which one will win. It's a nasty uphill finish here. Estinia have their man in the breakaway today as well. And there he is, coming back to check out the pack. Bruno Boscoda is still searching for that elusive stage win. He hasn't got it yet. And the main field, there's something like three and a half minutes back at the moment. The telecom team having to do all the work, led by Rolf Aldag. Christian Hen, the champion, the German champion in a white jersey, but he's very much a part of the telecom team. Both arms bandaged there for Jan Ulrich after his crashes. There is the green jersey wearer, Eric Zabel, all at or near the front of the peloton. There's the Queen Bee himself, Bjorn Aris, and Miguel Ingerain, never far from his side. It must be very strange for Ingerain to be shadowing the yellow jersey in a Tour de France at this stage of the event. And confirmation two of that breakaway, it is three minutes and 25 seconds. Also in that group, we have Marco Gualdi, Bo Hamburger, Jimaldin Abdu Japarov, Bourguignon, and Didier Roux of the GAN team. So that's the escape. They are now in the town of Toul, but there is still a way to go because we climb the hill which overlooks the town. In fact, under the three kilometre banner, an attack by Bo Hamburger of TVM. A Hamburger has made his move. And that doesn't look to be hardly any resistance. That's Laurent Madwas on the far right, and he was waiting for somebody else to go. He found nobody was. Jamaldin Abdu Japarov now chasing down Laurent Madwas. But I wonder if they know the finish here, because it's quite a little climb that climbs right up to the line. The crowd are up there. They can probably see from a great distance the enactment here of the tactics. Now it's little Jamaldin Abdu Japarov, the sprinter in the group, reaching out to catch up with Bo Hamburger. He's got him. Now, if the two of them can get together on the climb, there is a chance. There is Rue of Gann, a try to head up the chase. A little look over his shoulder and straight away, Bo Hamburger moves to the right of Abdu Japarov. They pass under the two kilometres to go banner. Well, nobody really expected Jamaldin Abdu Japarov to win a stage today, especially with the uphill finish to come. But he's now put himself in with a chance, and in fact, he's launching himself at it. He's gone. He must have taken a good look at Bo Hamburger there, decided the rider didn't have it. The Danes are having a great tour. There are only five Danes in this race. Danish television is giving it 100 hours of coverage, and almost daily, in fact, I would say daily, we see one of those five Danes in the thick of the action when they know they're live on television. And that was Bo Hamburger, but I think, and I, do, I dread to say it, but he's fried. As Hamburger drops back, and he now leaves Jamaluddin Abdu Japarov out in the lead. Well, if he wins this, this is going to go down rather special in the annals of Jamaluddin Abdu Japarov, who is normally the sprinter of the Tour de France. And this year, we thought he might have had a chance to equal Sean Kelly's victories of four green jerseys over the years. But it doesn't look like he's going to challenge for that, as Madwas now has been joined by the Palti rider Merko Gualdi down there. Jamaldin Abdu Japarov has gone. Gualdi attacks Madwas. It looks as though Madwas is up to that. 
Madras marks, but Jamaldin Abdu Japarov, his face belying the pain as he absolutely flies up to the finish here. The road service is excellent. I think the town of Toul actually resurfaced the road for the finish. And now you'll see the huge crowd welcome a very popular man in the Tour de France, Jamaldin Abdu Japarov, 50 metres to go. I wonder if he'll look across to see if he's safe. No, he knows he's safe. This will be an extraordinary victory for Jamaluddin Abdu Japarov. He won his first stage of the Tour de France in 1991 in Lyon. The second place is going to Gualdi. He just gets in ahead of Long of Madras, who looks over in time to see Rue taking fourth place. And he'll be about 15, 16 seconds down. And no sign of Bo Hamburger, who was dropped on the climb. So Jamaldin Abdu Japarov gets what is in effect his ninth stage win of the Tour de France. He's won at Lyon, Reims, Dinard, Bordeaux, the Champs Elysees, Armentier, Lac Saint Pois. Last year, of course, he got the win again on the Champs Elysees, and now he's got the stage win here at Toul. Overall, no change at all. And while the riders make their way today towards villeneuve sur lot we believe there are still five can win this tour. That's how open it is. Let's assess their chances. Jan Arish's biggest asset is he came to this race believing he could win it. His confidence and morale couldn't be higher. He climbs and he time trials well and has made himself the man to beat. Current odds, the bookies make him the hot favourite. Abraham Olano, the first Spanish World Road Race champion, has finished second in the Tour of Spain last year and third in last month's Tour of Italy. He's never finished a Tour de France, but he's matured this season. His assets are he climbs and time trials better than most. Current odds, 6-1. to one. Evgeny Berzin is a fighter, but he's also susceptible to too many bad days. However, if he can get to within a minute of the leaders after the mountains, he could win this race in the time trial on Saturday. The current odds, 10 to 1. Tony Rominger has yet to prove himself to be anything other than a follower. He time trials with the best, but he's handicapped now with the higher place of his teammate Olano. He also has an injured right knee, and his hopes are fading. His current odds, though, 7 to 1. Miguel Indurain has the most to do, but everyone knows his ability after five wins. Champions hate to lose races, and Miguel will do his best not to lose this one, but he will have to ride better than ever before. His current odds, he's now second favourite at 11 to 4. But those odds indicating, in fact, many people still think Miguel Indurain can win this year's Tour de France. Today we're racing on through the hot roads down to villeneuve sur lot Without, I'm afraid, the American George Hincap, who crashed yesterday and has been pulled out by the team doctors because he hit his head. He should be OK, and he is already selected for the Olympic Games. We join the action now. There's a breakaway establishing at the front of six riders, and that is the time gap, 8 minutes 29 seconds. Well, so far, this has been a great Tour de France for the people of Denmark. They've enjoyed their men in the action all of the days. Let's now join Gary Imlach and find out more about the five riders from Denmark. Oh. To the roll of honour that includes Lager, Lerpak and the Laudrup brothers, the Danes can now add home Hamburger, Skibby, Sorensen and Rees. There are only five of them but the Danes are having a great tour. Bjarne Arise, the winner of the stage, 46 kilometers today. It's done an awful lot of damage. Uh, right now in Denmark, if you compare football, the cycling is on the same level if it's not a little bit higher now. Sorensen gets it on the line. Rodriguez is second, Berenk is third, LeBlanc is fourth. And that was a deserved result for Rolf Sorensen. Very, very good uh, for Danish cycling, and uh, I think uh, we've reached the peak, and it's, we have to we have to do something about it. So far in the tour, there have been stage wins for Reese and Sorensen, second place for Skibby, home working hard to keep his leader in the yellow jersey, and all of them appearing at the front on just about every stage for a huge TV audience back home. It's craziness in Denmark now. People leave their, their work. We hear from. Uh, from uh, about uh, theater rehearsals with, which are interrupted, uh, film shootings interrupted. People want to see the race. The minority of the Danish population not watching the five hours of live TV coverage a day seems to have decided to see it in person. And they're having a pretty good tour too. 
The question remains though, how so few riders can have such a great impact on the race. I don't know, I just think we are lucky to have a very good generation of riders. Um, and um, it's great. I have no idea really. I think it's just luck. <laughs> of course the other question is where Jesper Skibby got his haircut and whether he took his helmet off during it. But all that matters to the Danish fans is winning their first tour. And it's great to hear too that the Danish people have voted cycling their number one sport of the moment. Back to the breakaway now. Neil Stevens taking a drink and the best place rider in this breakaway is uh, Michela Bartoli. He's 29th but he's more than 28 minutes behind the leader so there's a real chance that nobody will be seeing this breakaway today. That's an attack there by Massimo Podenzana former double champion of Italy but not a prolific winner at all now trying to uh, show them the way home here for what would be his first ever stage winning the Tour de France he lies 69 minutes behind in 80th place overall and he's gone Stevens was looking over his shoulder to see if anybody was going to take it up certainly Peter Van Petergen wasn't he's dropped to the back of the group and a counter-attack coming straight away this looks like Bartoli Bartoli was the most likely man to succeed but he's immediately been countered by Francois Le Marchand the other riders in this breakaway were Guirini, well, he's the only other rider, in fact I haven't mentioned, and Guirini sitting uh, midway down the race now, that's him tacked on the back actually. Neil Stevens has gone, he's gone very quickly into this round, in fact his back wheel's locked up, I don't know what's happened there, I think he's hit the lamppost. In fact, Neil Stevens went into that corner so quickly, his tyres come off. Now, whether that was a fault of the tyre coming off before the crash, or as a result of the way his back wheel was locked up, either way, he misjudged the angle of that corner, and uh, rather lucky that those plastic barriers were in position. Stevens there, looking good to have got across. What bad luck that was for Neil Stevens. He was beaten to Montpellier by Rolf Sorensen last time and now he's lost his chance of a stage win here. He's having a very good season indeed. Already picked for the Australians for the Olympic Games. Well, that's something that Pod Denzana can't vouch for. He's Italian and he's heading up to his first ever win in a Tour de France now. In fact, Pod Denzana rode his first tour only last year and he finished a very creditable 26th. Now, can anybody bring him back? There he is, they just can't quite reach him. Massimo Poddenzana is going to get the victory here in what is stiflingly warm conditions. As he comes up to the line now, he's going to enjoy the next few moments. He broke away, he chose the right moment. Neil Stevens tried to reach him and was unable to get across to him. And that was rather sad for the Australian because the second place now is going to go to Guirini. First time rider in the tour, he gets second. And the third place, well, it's a sprint here between Van Pietigum and Bartoli. Van Pietigum is the TVM rider and looks to be going clear. So he will get third and Bartoli fourth. And the lone figure of Neil Stevens. It's almost two minutes on the clock there, but Stevens has got a new bike and he'd be very, very disappointed with that sixth place with Neil Stevens. The victory going to the Italian Massimo Poddenzana at Villeneuve sur Lot. The man has certainly lost out, Neil Stevens, so let's join Paul Sherwin, who's now with him, the man they call Stevo. Well, Stevo, you look pretty good in the break there. In fact, we thought you looked one of the freshest. Yeah, you know, like uh, I said to Poddenzana just out the road, you know, like the, you know, I didn't care who won, but the TVM guy I was sitting on all day, I'm sure he wasn't going to win. And when he took off, I just sort of sat behind the TVM guy. And then when uh, Bartley went, I saw I tried to go with him and I forged my tie, come off of the, one, of the, one of the roundabouts and down I went. It looked as if you went into the roundabout a little bit too quickly there and that may be what the problem was. Yeah, you know, the, I think the glue should hold on though, but anyway, I, I'll have a bit of word to the mechanic later on the seat and see what he says. <laughs> well, Bjarne Rees still the overall leader. Here's Gary Imlach with rumour on the street. Bjarne, everybody's looking forward to tomorrow's stage. You, you said that you're looking to win it by two minutes. Do you still feel as good? Well, two minutes, you never know what happens, but I would like to have two minutes to the others, that's for sure. I do what I can and we have to see what happens. Is it your kind of stage tomorrow with that huge finish? If I do a good race, yes. <laughs> well, that's the answer to everything. They'd all love to do a good race. Lord's Otokam was last used two years ago. 
It is a very difficult climb. If you're watching two years ago, you remember it was covered in fog. We never really got a good look at it at all. Well, it's in sunshine today. There's only one survivor left of an early breakaway, and that is Long Rue of the TVM. He's proving to be a very aggressive rider this year, making a lot of friends because of it. But the chase down is now beginning as we start the lower slopes of Otakam. The main field is more or less together here. Original breakaways all swept up. It's been a good day of racing by just a handful of riders trying to slip away, but they haven't managed to do that. The team car on the left of our picture there was TVM, which means we must be coming up on Laurent Rue. The indications are well, the gaps have been closing all of the time. Miguel Ingerain, who was on the attack with Luc Leblanc two years ago, conceded the stage win, but really did kill off all of his rivals sitting there near the front of the pack. Abraham Olana, the world champion, he's a standout, as we can see on the far left, an attack by Alex Zula, this is the first serious attack, it comes with 10 kilometres to climb to the summit, and Alex Zula is going to give it a go. If he gets away and gets the time, he will be back in the frame in a big way here, Zula, grits his teeth and accelerates away, now what sort of a reaction will this claim? The first man that Zula will see will be the little petite climber, Laurent Roux of France, there he is, and here comes Zula, so Laurent has blown to the wall because the rest of the race is just behind, and Zula goes straight by him. Laurent Brochard, Richard Varenk at the front, Miguel Ingerain still there, so too Jan Ulrich, what a surprise Jan Ulrich is turning out to be. And it looks as though the tempo, they've just outridden Zula and brought him straight back into the pack. And I think the man that done the damage was Miguel Ingerain himself, so the first and second in last year's Tour de France are right on the front now. And one or two riders beginning to find the sting in the tail here, not least Tony Rominger. There's Evgeny Berzin, who's been rather quiet uh, since he got his good hiding on the road to Sestria in the Alps. But maybe he'll come back into his own on this climb. Nobody willing. Bjorn Reese seems to be moving up and down the race group here, taking a good look at the riders in the front. There he is, number 21. He's, he's just looked across at one or two of the faces. He keeps on doing it. He's riding alongside the man I think he might think will attack. 111 there, Luc Leblanc. Abraham Alana, Piotr Ugrimov, Evgeny Berzin, all of the big names are still in this front group. Uh, going off from the side of Varenk is Bjorn Ries and now from Ulrich. Ulrich looks across at him and you know Ulrich has sort of sat back there and allowed his team captain to accelerate and uh, well having said that they've come back to him and the rider who's brought them back is Miguel Ingerain. Today we have got to see the start of the return of Miguel if he's going to get back all of the time he has lost. The majority of it of course coming on the climb uh, to Les Arcs more than a week ago. The yellow jersey, it's a fine sight when the man who leads the tour has all of the strength to dominate the front of the main group, as he's doing here, there's nobody in front of this group now. Injurain trying desperately to ride alongside him and remind him just who he is. Richard takes a good look at them. He continues to build his lead in the King of the Mountains. Yet another brutal acceleration by Bjorn Arise. And still nothing, they just follow his wheel. Oh, this time he's pulled about seven riders clear here. Reese, he's masking at Miguel. And now the motorcycle's masking my view, but he's gone out the way and we're seeing, oh, Berzin's in trouble. He's falling back from the back wheel of Escartine, the green shorty rider in front. So Berzin again caught in the mountains and this only the first day in the Pyrenees, the brutal days still lie ahead, the hardest days of the tour undoubtedly, with the longest days to come to Pamplona, where we will actually race past the home of Miguel. Another attack by Bjorn Ruiz. this has got to be his third or fourth attack here, he keeps on softening them up but they still claw their way back up, this he's keeping on a little bit longer because he spread the whole field in this breakaway, as Bjorn Ruiz goes once more. I think it's Laurent Dufault who's trying to get up to him. And Ingerain is slipping down. He's lost the grip of first wheel up by the leader, Bjorn Arise. Ingerain is moving back down the field here, and I wonder if he's cracked again. Bjorn Arise continues to stay out of the saddle and keep on the pressure. Ingerain has cracked. He's being caught here by Lutenberger and by Abraham Olano. 
The two Spanish riders, first and second in the World Championships and the World Team Time Trial last year, are now detached from the league group by an inspired Bjorn Arist. This yellow jersey has done all of the attacking and he's watched the riders tire one by one. He now has just three riders left behind him to worry about. There's still a long way to climb here. There's Dufo, the two Festina riders, Richard Berenc, Luc Leblanc. Memories now a little bit foggy of two years ago when he was won the climb here. And it looks now as though the yellow jersey is playing the cards which will win in the Tour de France because he really is showing them who is the best man. Five kilometers to climb, he can pick up an awful lot of time, but then again, he can also blow up. As Bjorn Lloris heads up towards the summit. And the lone figure here at number 166, that is Leonardo Pipoli. And Laurent Dufault having his best tour as well. Rocking and rolling a little bit, Brochard in the chase group now. Where is the, and here he is, I was saying about where's number one. But Miguel Ingerain is now being dispatched from the group that contains his Spanish countryman, Abraham Olano. Ingerain, it seems, started this climb with the determination to show either himself or the race he was still very much in it because he rode right on the front, but he could not take that third or fourth acceleration from Bjarne Ries. He's now under that five kilometers to go banner. His lead is nosing up. Bjorn Aris produced something special. And you know, in the story he told journalists just before Christmas, he said he knew how to beat Miguel Ingerain. But before I tell you that story, there's Rominger with a bandage on his right knee. He has had one or two very nasty crashes, and I think that knee is now giving him trouble. He'll be a little bit surprised. He was dropped early on on the climb. Now he's coming up behind Ingerain, and I think he's going to try and accelerate right by uh, Miguel. Miguel might lift his pace a little bit, but it doesn't look as though he can. Ingerain just looks across because the road goes around to the right. Way up in the sky there. But to come back to my story about Bjorn Arise, he did say that he believes that Ingerain could only hold his power for so long on the big climbs. If he could allow him just that time, he could then attack him and destroy him. And that's exactly what has happened today. Reese has never had such physical condition as this. He's proving to be a superb wearer of the Mayo Jean. He's doing something, in fact, that Miguel Ingerain never could do, win a road race stage while riding in the leader's yellow jersey. Ingerain, by my notes now, is falling away from this year's Tour de France and is happening on the entry to his own country in Spain. Rominger. An inspired return to the forward groups here because now he's coming up on the next group which contains Lutenberg and I think Abraham Olano. This is the chase group of Bjorn Aris led by Laurent Dufault, Richard Varenc, Luc Leblanc, Leonardo Pipoli is the fourth man who's done a good ride to get across. Rominger now the driving power in the chase group trying to recuperate some of that lost time. They're not going to catch this man though. He won at Sestria to get the yellow jersey. He's now going to win his first day in the Pyrenees at Otakam to increase his lead in it. Reese taking the short way around as he climbs up to Otakam. There's no way back but down the way you come up to this mountain which stands uh, some 25 kilometers away from the city of Lourdes. Even though you're tired, you just feel so inspired when you know that everybody is behind you. And what class, Virenk, Dufault, people he's sitting here at the back as he rides behind the three Frenchmen, well, two Frenchmen and a Swiss, but three French-speaking riders. A massive crowd here at Otakam who have followed this most interesting tour these last week, couple of weeks. And look at this now, a signal from Rees to say, it's me, I'm number one. A determined face on him, he spins up towards the line, this is going to be one of Bjorn Arishi's greatest ever victories now to win a stage like this when you wear the Mayo Jean to look at the riders and blow them one by one off your wheel you know you are the very best inside five hours for the ride as well Bjorn Arishi gets the victory he will increase his overall lead by every second he stops over that line and these riders stay out this side of it 
Lord Dufo trying to open the sprint, but he'll have a little problem for his own teammate, I think, Richard Varenk, because there are mounting points here as well. Dufo takes a good look at Varenk, realises he needs the points for the King of the Mountains. He probably won't challenge him, but he wants to conserve time. And he digs deep to find that little extra effort to hang on to Richard Varenk as they race to the line. And Luc Leblanc will have to be settling for fourth place. Varenk comes clear. And Dufo in the same time gets third. It's a good result for Festina. Luc Leblanc comes over the line in fourth place. And they're almost a minute behind conceded. Tony Rominger is going to be best of the rest with a sixth place finish. But he's going to lose the best part of a minute and a half or more. And just behind him is Jan Ulrich, another fine ride by this youngster who was the 1993 World Amateur Champion. A great sprinter, a great time trialist and a great climber. All the qualities you need to one day win the Tour de France. Miguel Indurain is going to finish in 12th place, a far cry from the second place just behind Luc Leblanc of two years ago when he was already in a commanding overall lead. I think it's safe to say now Indurain is not going to win his sixth successive Tour de France and he'll stay a member of the famous Five Club. The man today though is Bjorn Arise. Here he is winning the stage and now he is with our Paul Sherwin. Seven kilometres to go on the climb today. You dropped to the back of the group. Was that mm -hmm. just to check out how everybody was? Then you, then you just went. Yeah. Well, I wanted to see how they looked in the faces, and most of them didn't look so well. So I ch tried a few times just to, not 100 percently to, to. I attacked, but not 100 percently. And then I saw they were in difficulties, so I tried to went away and. It worked. You surprised that Indra and cracked? Well, yes and no. I think on the, no on the mountains he didn't look so good uh, until now. And I saw him today in the beginning. He looked a little bit heavy. Not so, so good as the other years. So I'm sorry for him. I would like to have, have, have him on the podium with me. But... Well, it's the race and I'm sorry for him. I would like if he could win tomorrow. What a gracious man Bjorn Arise is. He now wins this stage by 49 seconds over Virenk and Laurent Dufo. Overall, his lead is now up to 2 minutes and 42 seconds over Abraham Olano. Rominger is up to third. And so to the feared 17th stage, the longest stage of the Tour, 163 miles. It crosses the Giants of the Pyrenees as we leave France bound for Pamplona. And as we head for Pamplona, here's Gary Imlac with his opinion on the city's most famous pastime. For those with ball byproduct for brains and a need to prove their manhood, Pamplona is the place to be in July for the running of the bulls. The Festival of Sam for Men this year produced no fatalities. Except, of course, for the Bulls eventually when they got to the ring. Just the usual mixture of locals and tourists, demonstrating the effects of the usual mixture of sangria and stupidity. The patron saint of gratuitous machismo, Ernest Hemingway, who popularised Sam Fermin through his novel The Sun Also Rises, has been honoured by Pamplona with a street and a statue named after him. Today, though, all the attention will be on a more local hero. Miguel Indurain was born just a few kilometres from today's finish, and the route goes past his mum and dad's doorstep. Despite the fact that he won't be riding by in the yellow jersey, the locals have done him proud, with banners and a mini grandstand for all his well-wishers. Mind you, as the official drink of the tour, I don't think Coke will be too thrilled about the catering arrangements. Well, Gary Imlach, uh, not really a supporter of bull running in Pamplona. As we now join the race, the attack here coming from Neil Stevens. He's gone on over the top of the Col d'Obisque. And Stevens has gone out very early on today. He certainly isn't a climber, but because of the long stage it is, this Pascal Hervé going over in second place in Mikola Bartoli. The reason I think that the field have not worried too much about Neil Stevens is because they're scared of the distance and the heat. 36 degrees Celsius forecast, very light winds and very hot indeed. And it will be an easy day on which to destroy yourself with the climbs of the Col de Soulor. Col de Bisque now behind us as we head on here to the climb of the Col de Soudé. Stevens has won the climb over the Marie Blanc. This is an outstanding piece of riding by the man we never considered to be a climber, but this is the way the race is going this year. 
The infighting is already beginning amongst the heads of state of the event. Two minutes, four seconds down for Ugrimov, uh, leading over this group. Renk, Reese and Ugrimov was the order. As they went over the top of that climb, and already Reese is beginning to show his strength here and move clear. Indrain is in all sorts of trouble. He has been dropped on the climb of the Sude and is reported to be almost two minutes back. Here's Luc Leblanc, who's climbed his way up to alongside the yellow jersey of Bjorn Reese. Uh, Peter Lutenberger is here too, and turning out to be something of a star in the mountains in this year's Tour de France. And also in trouble again, apart from this man here who's now being dropped from that small elite group, Alana was in that group and so too was Tony Rominger. So Rominger now dropping away from third place overall as well. The whole thing is turning around once again. In Jurain, I think at this point now, nobody is any longer surprised seeing him off the back of the groups. Clearly his form is not good. It is sad though to think that after all these years we're going home to Miguel Indurain City and he will not be wearing the leader's yellow jersey. And somebody is applying the pressure at the front of this group as well and they're taking time out of Indurain all of the way up the climb. We're heading up towards the top of the Port de Laro, the all category climb. A yellow wig, but not a yellow jersey for Big Mig. And I think he's just turning those pedals over. It's almost uh, something he's doing automatically because he is in serious trouble. And don't forget, these are roads over the years he must have trained many thousands of miles. Massive crowds have turned out. The Basque flag of Spain is down there waving away at the forward elite group and this uh, I must say this elite group which is now uh, pick, has now picked up uh, Neil Stevens and in fact trouble for Varenk he's just had a flat but he's changed it very very quickly and a very good change it was too he's not going to panic here because he's still on the tail of the group magnificent wheel change as Varenk sprints back up towards the leading pack now as he got back in time to get to the front and snatch the points for the King of the Mountains, Laurent Dufault, his teammate, who's also riding to a high position overall now, waited for him, is now trying to get him through in time to get the points at the top of the Port de Laro. Varenk racing through on the inside, it is Bjorn Lloris keeping control of the pace at the front. Peter Lutenberger, Escartine, Dufault are the last three riders here. And you know, I think Varenka has got through. He raced straight back up to the front. He should be there in time to go for the maximum points on this all category climb. This is the situation when the crowd were getting a little bit excited here. Oops, a daisy. I think uh, Richard Varenk made his feelings known there. Anyway, he's now back on the front. As he comes up towards the top of the climb. He's got uh, Pyotr Ugrimov. And Bjorn Reese are the two riders directly behind him. Laurent Dufault has climbed his way through the group as well. 4 minutes 40 seconds, the gap. The Tour de France is right here now. We go away from the Pyrenees tomorrow and race back into the border town of Ondai. And then we start our way up to the final showdown around saint emilion for the time trial. And then all that remains is the journey to the Champs-Élysées in Paris. The crowd just fanning back as Richard Varenk takes maximum points on the Port de, Saint, uh, Port de la Roe to increase his overall lead in the King of the Mountains and uh, uh, he's pretty much untouchable in that now. He really has not had any challenge for that jersey for three years and he's going to be the man to win it three times straight. <laughs> well this is the look of the draw, he's now punctured again on the way down the Port de la Roe. This time he's going to have a little bit more effort. Maybe lucky for him, the, the climb itself doesn't have any real descent initially. And he should get back. This long, long stage of albeit 262 kilometers. And 7 minutes, 8 seconds now. So Alano has gone today as well. Indurain has gone on three occasions now and his lead, his loss are going to be in double figures when he gets to the finish. As we race in now towards the finish at Pamplona, the field is regrouped at the front. Jan Ulrich is in this group, you know that young man could be second overall and he's ridden unselfishly all of the time for his team leader and yet he still found the strength to go with the moves. He is in this lead group and there he is leading the race now, still thinking of Bjarne Ries. Varenk is right there behind him, followed by uh, Peter Lutenberger, 
who is doing what the Austrians had hoped from him and feature in the Tour de France. Laurent Dufault dropped off to our left and there's a searing attack. He came from nowhere. Did you see that from Bjorn Larice? He's just shot out of the pack and that's caused a bit of a reaction. In fact, Dufault has gone after him. Jan Ulrich is chasing him and I'm not too sure whether that's a wise move unless he feels with this distance to go, he really should think about getting into the move with Bjorn Larice. Rees has dropped back and I think it might be Dufault who's kept up the action if Dufault has gone across to the group. But they've all come back together again as indeed the yellow jersey goes again. The sharp left hand corner is heading up towards the finish. Round what is normally a big roundabout, there it is. And now the riders, we've got two riders clear here and I think Dufault has hung on to the back wheel of Bjorn Rees. This slight figure of the Swiss rider who's having a superb tour. This is only his fourth ever Tour de France. He's finished two of them, 35th and 19th. He was last year. He's improving all of the time. He looks across at Bjorn Arise. The gap has opened. Escartin has been left at the front of that group. Bjorn Arise has taken up the running now. Another emphatic ride by the Mayo Jean. He's gaining time over everybody again. Except, of course, Laurent Dufault, who's going to hang on and try and take this stage away from the Dane. The Dane has got two great stage victories on the road here in this year's tour in the mountains. He's come over the longest stage today in the Pyrenees. Is he going to make it three? Three very significant stage wins indeed. But he's going to lead out Laurent Dufault. And Dufault isn't a bad finisher either. And in fact, Bjorn Arise puts his head down, but Dufault has still a lot of speed despite the long hours in the saddle today. He gets his first ever stage win, a what a stage win to remember. The spin for third place, it looks like Richard Varenk being challenged by Jan Ulrich. Jan Ulrich takes him on, Varenk gets it from Ulrich. And so Ulrich's famous sprint blunted a little bit by the distance, and I'm not surprised for that young man. But here's the victory going to Laurent Dufault. Another great day, though, in the life of Bjarne Rees, who will increase his overall lead in the Tour de France and will push Miguel Indurain back into double figures, and no one would have thought that was possible. Here is the sprint from the Rominger group. And really, after eight and a half minutes, the gap, nobody is too interested in the result of that. Indurain made no effort to contest the sprint. He passed his home earlier on and there was a little grandstand outside. They cheered him by and he salutes the crowd. And this is a nice gesture of sportsmanship. Coming back to the podium, Bjorn Aris comes back especially to congratulate Miguel Indurain. The overall standings after stage 17, Bjorn Arise 3.59 ahead of his teammate now, Jan Ulrich. Varenk is up to third and look at this, Indurain 15 minutes down in 11th place. Well it should be a little bit easier today, just 96 miles on the road to Ondai. And I should imagine the sight of the sea here in Ondai will be a source of welcome relief to those remaining in this year's Tour de France. Well there were many changes over the past two days so let's now update you with all of the jersey competitions. In the green jersey points competition, Eric Zabel is proving an equally obstinate leader and has a lead of 57 points. He leads over the Frenchman, Frédéric Moncassin. A high finish today for Zabel and that could end this competition with three days to go. The King of the Mountains is, for a third year, the private domain of Richard Varenk, who is 109 points ahead of Bjarne Rees. And providing Varenk finishes in Paris, he'll become the first triple winner of the competition since Julio Jiménez 30 years ago. In the Young Rider competition, Jan Ulrich has been outstanding and leads by virtue of his second place overall. This year, this classification has been dedicated to the memory of the Italian Fabio Cassatelli, the Olympic champion who died in the race last year when he crashed in the Pyrenees. During the race's passage through the mountains, the Tour de France visited the new memorial on the Col de Porte d'Aspe. Race director Jean-Marie Leblanc, Cassatelli's Motorola team manager Jim Okovitz, and rider and teammate Frankie Andreo, seen here placing a wreath, were present at a short but moving ceremony. And the Tour de France will always remember Fabio Cassatelli, as we all will. Back to the race now, here to Ondai, and the riders are forming at the front, looking for a chance to slip the field. It's been a day for the sprinters. Zabel has added a few more points. 
to his overall lead in the green jersey competition he's making that competition now his very own the small climbs have not produced anything really spectacular but this breakaway which got away is now going to treat us to a two-man sprint here between christian n another telecom man the champion of germany and bart voskamp of the TVM squad. The winds have been very, very strong today, blowing in off the ocean. And Voskamp, a Dutchman, has maneuvered Hen into the lead here and forced him to lead out. Hen is now going to have to make a long sprint of it. And coming on the protected side of the wind is Voskamp. And Voskamp, well, he gets the stage win for TVM. And that will go alongside the stage win of Jerome Blylevens way back at the beginning of this tour. But overall, no change at all today. Ulrich is still second, Varenk still third. And so the calm before the storm as the riders now face up for the long ride to Bordeaux. And then the time trial tomorrow, 140.7 miles today. And not surprisingly, the riders enjoying some very, very nice countryside. And the views aren't bad either. As the race now continues to be a battle for the green jersey and Moncassan again taking on Zabel, losing there at the town of Lyon after 83 kilometres. Baldato snatched the third place. Fabio Baldato sprinting better and better as this tour goes on. But the field refusing to crack under the pressures as we're now starting to wind up for the finish as we approach the city of Bordeaux, always a domain of the sprinters and Chris Boardman here launching an attack. He's had a rough ride through the mountains but he appears to be coming out quite strongly now. But they've gone right around him as they race for the line. It's a Rabobank rider who's gone. And I don't think on this it could be Danny Nellison but anyway I can't tell you from this height but in fact he's gone for the line. And the field are after him under the one kilometre to go banner now. The whole field still together. And this could be another win for Eric Zabel. You know, he's been sprinting so well. He's had two stage wins so far. The team have worked hard to keep him all together. That looks like the style now of Yatislav Yekimov on the right of our picture. As he still tries to get that elusive stage win with a lace last kilometre run at the line. But they're coming right up to him and I think they have him under control. Zabel I've caught a glimpse of in the green jersey. It's being led out now by Christian Hen, the telecom rider, who was second yesterday. And a big surge now coming up on the left-hand side. Baldato is down there too. Abdu Japarov has got in on the action. Andre Schmil is off to the left. And this is going to be a very good finish indeed. There's Zabel and he's got Moncasan on his wheel. They're switching around a bit. Andre Schmil has made a break for the line. He's being chased by an MG rider. I think it's Bartoli. But now the run is coming and still Zabel and Moncasan have yet to make a move. Right into the centre of our picture now. Zabel is coming. He's got Moncasan on his wheel and Moncasan is coming off his wheel. Moncasan has got it on the line with a fabulous piece of sprinting. That was judged to inch perfection by Frédéric Moncasan. And that will be his second stage win of this year's Tour de France. But I don't think it'll be enough now to win in the green points jersey in Paris. Even so, a stage win is a stage win. And it was led out here by Fabio Baldato, who crashed out of the race a year ago. And he didn't quite have the legs to hang on to the line. Look at the surge here coming from Eric Zabel, but it was read perfectly by Frédéric Moncassan, who was moving at full speed. First of all, the sprinters were together, and then they fanned out Moncassan, Zabel, Baldato. That's the order on the line, three top sprinters. And the green jersey stays with Eric Zabel. And that's going to be his now in Paris. 129 riders left in the Tour de France now as we head up for the moment of truth. Driving 62 and a half kilometres in a little more than an hour in a car, nothing but a leisurely drive. Try doing it on a bike in a time trial in the Tour de France. It personifies pain and suffering. The riders call the time trial the race of truth. It really is the ultimate battle between man and machine. And for everybody now, it should mean the final reshuffling of the classification. Chris Borman, will he fight back and land a good one? He set the mark during the time trial from an early mark out in the uh, climb up to Val d'Isère. Now this time trial should shoot him even more, if of course he's feeling OK. And the indications are he's leading at the checks. Miguel Indurain, here he is flying through. This is chasing the time of Chris Borman. 1.16.22, he's well inside, Chris. This is going to be a great ride by Big Mick. He will go fastest on the board after Bourbon. 118 for Bourbon, 116 for Miguel Ingerain. A little cobble street in the beautiful, beautiful town of Saint Emilion. They've all worked so hard to make this a great day out for everybody on the Tour de France today. 
Indurain refuses to lie down and I'm sure will go to the Atlanta Olympic Games and do his very best to snatch a gold medal in the time trial there. But this is developed now into a personal battle between the Festina riders Richard Varenk and his teammate Laurent Dufault. Varenk now coming home. This could switch around the overall classification for the third and fourth place. It's been an extraordinarily good ride by Varenk because look at the time. Varenk crosses the line. 118-01. That is going to keep him high up on the leaderboard and might well keep him third in Paris. Very good ride indeed by him. But the times are about to be rewritten, I think, because Ulrich has closed in, having started behind Richard Berenk. Now Jan Ulrich is going to do a great time here that should put him on top of the leaderboard. This young man who is a great time trial rider, the German Cycling Federation gave him a choice, the time trial in the Olympic Games or the Tour de France. He took the Tour de France and he's going to win the time trial, I think. 1.15.31, he has been up on Bjorn Arise all of the way by quite big margins. So Bjorn Arise is going to have to pull out something absolutely sensational now if he's going to knock off the top of the leaderboard Jan Ulrich, his young teammate. Rees is going to concede quite a big slice of his overall lead to Jan Ulrich and it now just goes to show how wise Rees was to take all of the time he could when he was out there on the mountains of the Pyrenees and in the Alps because Ulrich is finishing this tour so well and has to be seen as a winner of the future. But this year now, it's going to be Bjorn Arise who will get Denmark's first ever win in the Tour de France. Tomorrow they go to Paris and Bjorn Arise is coming home. No, not as the winner of the time trial, but his lead too much to be damaged, too much today. Although Ulrich has certainly closed in in second place overall. Bjorn Arise heads up to the finishing line now. He's going to concede a little bit of his time today. But Jan Ulrich will take the victory. There's Ulrich's time of 1.15.31. As Rees comes up to the line here, he's conceding more than two minutes of his overall lead to Jan Ulrich. And that's going to make it look a little bit more fragile when we look at the record books in the year to come. Ulrich wins from Miguel Indurain, who is on his way back. But overall, look at that now. Ulrich has closed in to a minute and 41 seconds. The last stage, stage number 21, Palaiseur to Paris, 147 and a half kilometres, and that is the site they've all waited to see. Eros Poly, little premature celebration, even if the bottom of the glass is broken. Well, it doesn't matter now, does it? It's all broken. On to the finish now, the riders are approaching the end of what has been one of the most remarkable Tours de France this year, and a tremendous race it has been too. The breakaway, which has been away for virtually all of the laps here on the Champs-Élysées, it looks like being wiped out. André Schmiel tapped in on the back of that breakaway, but the main field have been working very hard to close it down. The breakaway went on the first lap, but it is now coming back in together as the riders line up for the finish. The 129 survivors, and that is all of this viciously hard Tour de France. The last man for the record books is Master Puy of the Agrigel team. He will finish this tour almost four hours behind the winner, Bjorn Aris of Denmark. Into the tunnel now for the last time and out into the daylight again. The riders lining up for a sprint. This has been a great tour for the great sprints as well. They've all been here. Cipollini again will not see the finish in Paris. He made his mark very early on. In fact, not very far away at Wascal when the tour came into France in the north. Now they go back down the Place de la Concorde heading towards the finish here. One kilometre to go. Will the sprinters hang on and have their day yet again? First of all, they've got to catch that little breakaway, which contains Pascal Richard, Johan Museo, they're all up there. But I think they will now because you can't hold back floodwaters of this pressure as they come towards the breakaway. They are catching them. The breakaway itself knows it's all over. They can sit back. They have a grandstand seat now for the sprinters. There'll be the dash across the Place de la Concorde, the right flick. And there's one rider there trying desperately to survive to the end, but he's not going to do it now. I think it's Flavio Vanzella of Motorola who's made the dash for the line. But the field is all together. As the field make the right turn for the finish now, it's going to be a day for the sprinters. Schmil is still in there, right on the front as they make the turn. Now they will see the finishing banner, and it's going to be a battle. Baldato is in the centre of the picture. 
as they try to reach the finish first. But it's not going to be for the breakaway. Schmil and Co are being wiped away as the top spinders come on the left. Baldato, Moncasan, Zabo, Blyleven's coming now. Baldato trying to hold on. Abdu Jafrov's there. Fabio Baldato gets it. That was a sprint, Royale. Every top sprinter, and I think they've all landed in the top five places on the stage. The victory going to Fabio Baldato from Frederic Moncasan on the right. And on the far left of our picture, Jerome Blyleven's. He gets there, but what a just result. The man who hadn't won the stage so far gets it now. But the man who's won the Tour de France, Bjorn Aris of Denmark, the first time ever for a Dane to win the Tour. He's won it well from a man who I'm sure will win this Tour in the future, Jan Ulrich, a minute 41 advantage. Richard Varenk climbs onto the podium as well in third place after a great battle with his teammate, Laurent Dufaux, who gets fourth. The Danish flag flying high on the Champs-Élysées as they salute the crowd and Zabel the first German since 1990 to get green. This has been Denmark's tour. What a great feeling it must be for Rees and the crowd. They've enjoyed a day really very special. And they won't be the only ones enjoying an end to this tough tour. They have raced through the rain, the wind, the snow and the heat to get to the Champs-Élysées. All 129 of them deserving their finish. 18 riders won stages in this year's Tour de France. Not all of those will finish the race, but they did enjoy a precious moment, as indeed we did with them. Let's now remind ourselves as to who they were. Alex Zula was the first leader after the prologue in Holland. He suffered and crashed in the mountains, though, and will finish disappointed. Frederic Moncassan, two stage wins and a yellow jersey. This has without doubt been Fred's best tour. Mario Cipollini, the flamboyant Italian, got his stage win and then gave up the race. The Olympics are now his target. Eric Zabel, the German sprinter with two stage wins, is set to celebrate his first green jersey in Paris this afternoon. Cyril Sogran, a newcomer to the Tour, he was a surprise winner at the Lac de Madine, but then he abandoned a few days later. Jerome Blyleven's Holland sprinter got an early win on stage five, but in finishing his first tour, he also blunted his rapid sprint finish. Michael Bogart, another Dutchman in the fray when he took the risks in the wet at Aix-les-Bains. He's enjoyed his tour with one stage win and a high finish in Paris. Luc Leblanc, he'll be remembered as the man who won in the Alps the day Miguel Indurain cracked. He would have liked to have finished higher. Evgeny Berzin, the Russian started well with the yellow jersey and a stage win in the Alps, but the Pyrenees beat him and his tour became a disappointment. Bjorn Aris, multiple stage wins for him and the yellow jersey for the final 12 days of this tour. He really has been the best. Kepi Gonzalez, a Colombian winner on a flat stage, means we'll always remember him. It was an occasion to enjoy. Pascal Richard, the Swiss rider is an opportunist and one stage win for him plus a top half finish will leave him very contented. Rolf Sorensen, another success for Denmark, Rolf won at Superbest. He'll also be on the Champs-Élysées today. Jamaluddin Abdu Japarov got his win in an uphill finish, one hill treasure and his ninth stage win in seven tours. Massimo Poddenzana, another veteran, but for him his first stage victory in any Tour de France, it came at villeneuve sur lot Laurent Dufault, enjoying his best tour ever, Laurent won in Spain and will enjoy his highest finish today. Bart Voskamp, rarely a winner, Voskamp chose his third tour to taste victory. And yesterday, Jan Ulrich, who is set now to finish second in his very first Tour de France, he put in his claim to be a future winner of this great race when he took out the time trial. And well he might be, but let's not forget in the year that Miguel Indurain lost the Tour de France for the first time in six years, he was a champion to the end. He made sure he finished, he finished 11th, almost 15 minutes behind. I hope you've enjoyed the coverage. I'm Phil Liggett speaking on behalf of Gary Imlach and Paul Sherwin. And for World Cycling Productions, until the next time, goodbye.